Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the subject of extending the reach of virtual wheeling with tradable electricity credit tokens. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I will be your host at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to our presenters who will be introduced to you now uh, by the sharing with you of the biographies of the presenters on the Zoom chat facility. So have a look at the Zoom chat facility. You should see a link which you can download the biographies of the presenters. A big welcome also to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. This webinar is co-hosted by EE Business Intelligence and Meridian Economics. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Standard Bank, Allen and & Overy, and Africa Green Co. for their valued sponsorship, as well as to ESCOM, the South African Independent Power Producers Association, and the Power Futures Laboratory of the UCT Graduate School of Business for their valued support in putting this webinar together and the great work that they do in this field. We have about 1,950 delegates registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered, as well as to the stature of the presenters. May I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the significant time and effort that they have put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the question and answer, the Q&A text facility, and not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally, and we will certainly try to get to you. We've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, wheeling of electricity is an important energy accounting framework that enables customers to access power from off-site distributed generators to meet their price hedging and decarbonization objectives. Currently, wheeling models in South Africa suffer from significant implementation and financial risk exposure problems for ESCOM, for municipal electricity distributors, for off-takers, generators, and financial institutions. This actually limits the reach of wheeling, as well as the scale and rate of distributed generation expansion that can be viably financed and implemented. So this webinar considers the implementation of an electricity credit token mechanism that could overcome many of these challenges and unlock much greater distributed generation investment in South Africa. In addition to enabling customers to meet their own objectives, this could also expedite the resolution of load shedding and avoid further pressure on municipal and national public finances. Dr. Krivia Stein of Meridian Economics has developed this concept of token wheeling and has published an important paper presenting this mechanism and its details. And so, as the first part of this webinar, Dr. Krivia Stein, the Managing Director at Meridian Economics, will explain the concept of token wheeling and take you through his paper, which will now be shared with you on the Zoom chat facility. A link will be provided to you. You can click on the link and download this document uh, written by um, it's at Meridian Economics. So after this, um, uh, after uh, uh, has taken us through his concept, uh, Mondi Bala, 
of S-curve distribution. Then Vincenzia Lightyear of Standard Bank will respond with insights from a financial perspective, from a legal perspective. Finally, Anna Hajduka of Africa Green Co. will respond with insights from a buyer and trader perspective. Then, Atfana Marava of the South African Independent Power Producer Association will summarize and provide some of his own takeaways from what he's heard. And lastly, uh, uh, of the power, sorry, I got that wrong, Bukalwa, Bukalwa uh, and Zamandi of the Power Futures Laboratory at the UCT Graduate School of Business will moderate a 30-minute panel discussion, Q&A session. Sorry about that, uh, Bukalwa. Uh, I seem to have uh, confused you with your colleague, Christine, uh, but a uh, big welcome to you. Uh, but before we do this panel discussion and Q&A session, I'm going to be conducting an important online poll with you as the informed audience of this webinar on the way forward for token wheeling. So please do not leave early as this is important for us to hear your voice on the subject. So without uh, further ado, may I now introduce to you our first presenter, that is Dr. Grovia Stein. Grovia is the founding partner and MD at Meridian Economics, specializing in infrastructure regulation, policy and restructuring. He combines high-level strategic insight with strong economic and financial analytic skills. He takes interest in the economic and institutional complexities of developing infrastructure and appreciates the challenge of aligning stakeholder perspectives of investors, financiers, service users, policy makers, and regulators. He serves on the president, that is President Ramaphosa's Economic Advisory Council, and he was a member of the president's Eskom Sustainability Task Team. Gravier has a Master of Engineering in, Engineer in Energy Studies from the UCT, and he has a PhD in Economics from Sussex University. Gravier, it's a pleasure to have you here, and I'm now going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Um, I trust you can all hear me. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much to the colleagues on the panel. I'm looking forward to, uh, to a very uh, productive and interesting conversation. <clears throat> so. Firstly, perhaps let me start by saying this, um, the, the proposals we've developed really present a further evolution of existing wheeling models. And so we are, of course, building and standing on the shoulders of others uh, who have done important work in this area, particularly conventional wheeling and uh, virtual wheeling. Um, our proposals are is also not a silver bullet. Um, it's of course, uh, it, it will have its own challenges, um, but we hopefully uh, we hope that it, it will present further progress and an improvement on on e existing wheeling models. So basically, uh, I think what we're also saying is, if token wheeling is going to be a viable solution, it will need to be supported by many stakeholders and its development driven by industry. So it's it's up to us. Uh, We've been looking forward to this event and to the critical and constructive feedback from panelists and stakeholders. So thank you all very much for, for being here today. So the presentation is really only is organized into four sections. We're going to just talk briefly about the importance of unlocking current barrier, barriers to wheeling and extending its reach. And Chris has done most of our job there for us already. We'll give you an overview of the electricity credit token wheeling uh, system, but of course there's a detailed report on our website that sets out the ideas in further detail. We'll talk about the key benefits of the system, uh, and then we'll have a short uh, few points about the important next steps in the role of business and other, other stakeholders. So let's talk a bit about the importance of unlocking uh, wheeling. Uh, at a national level, we are all well aware of the crisis of load shedding and that the race is on to resolve load shedding, but that we are not yet winning. Uh, the, the scenarios, the thousands of scenarios we've modeled, uh, which we give a stylized presentation here of on, on this graph, shows that in scenarios where ESCOM plant performance deteriorates and new capacity is not added fast enough, 
we still face substantial risk for extensive load shedding over many years, as indicated by the red line. And even in the best case scenarios where ESCOM plant performance improves and plant capacity is added uh, uh, at a, on an ambitious time scale, we are still facing the challenge of load shedding for uh, a, a, probably about two, two or one and a half years. So this is a huge challenge. The risk, the area of risk between these two lines is enormous, and we need to eliminate the upper end of this risk uh, band uh, urgently. So at a national level, that's the, why it's so important. Of course, at a firm level, uh, customers have uh, urgent additional uh, needs and objectives. They need to hedge against additional further tariff increases. We've seen enormous tariff increases in South Africa over the last 10, 15 years in real terms. They also need to decarbonize their, their, their operations to meet their climate-related trade objectives and uh, comply with carbon, you know, deal with carbon tax that's going to be introduced. And of course, uh, increasingly, the providers of capital to firms also have the demand that they de decarbonize their operations. So essentially, the key points about unlocking wheeling and extending its reach is that private power will be critical to meet these national and firm level objectives. Um, so yes, the early signs are reasonably encouraging. Uh, private power is definitely getting a good uh, start in, in, in South Africa, in the corporate market, the CNI market. But we really do need it to be scaled up dramatically and sustained at higher levels of build to, to meet our needs. Um, it's therefore uh, not surprising that we see, uh, if you look at the NECOM Energy Action Plan, that power, the, the, the role of private, private power plays an important uh, part there. Um, the key point is that accelerating private power will be will critically depend on establishing wheeling models that make it easy for aggregators to construct a portfolio of generators and other system resources and to serve customers that are either large or small with single or multiple off-tax sites and are located in municipal areas or on the ESCOM grid. The challenge, of course, in our view, is that current wheeling models are not well suited for the task and will only have limited reach. So we, we don't have time today to go into the details of how these models work and what the challenges are with them. That's outlined in our report. But perhaps just to say briefly, conventional wheeling must be implemented in distributor billing systems. It's difficult to scale to large numbers of generators and customers. And experience now clearly shows that it's unlikely to be implemented in most municipalities anytime soon, given the many policy and practical challenges with, uh, that have to be overcome with this, with this, um, with this implementation. Virtual wheeling, a newer model that certainly improves in some of the challenges with uh, conventional wheeling, uh, as currently proposed by ESCOM, entails the initial double payment for power to both the IPP and to the distributor as you pay your normal bill. You still have to pay your standard distributor bill. And then the system requires cash refunds from ESCOM to customers on the basis of municipal payments of the ESCOM bulk accounts. So right there, one can, of course, see, see the problem. This exposes projects and customers to both municipal and ESCOM credit risk. Anyway, so given the scale of what must be achieved, uh, current wheeling models are still in the early stages of development and are likely not to give us the reach that we need. So then we started thinking about ways of improving, improving this situation. And so we, we kind of gave ourselves these uh, design aims for token wheeling. We, uh, the full name is electricity credit token wheeling, but we, we simply refer to it shortly as token wheeling. Firstly, in order to achieve the objectives of accelerating significantly the rollout of private power, we thought that it's going to be really important to de-risk the purchase decision for customers by creating a liquid secondary market, uh, thereby enabling more customers to sign up for more power. And of course, having the option of adjusting their positions if they find themselves uh, in need of less or more power in future. Uh, you know, currently customers uh, get power from a utility, and of course they have the option of just increasing their demand, their usage, or reducing it with no, no consequences. But when they have to negotiate a PPA, 
on your conventional wheeling agreement with an IPP, of course, they have to sign long-term agreements, and that doesn't necessarily meet their meet their requirements, and it's very risky and has and has balance sheet implications. We also need to enable customers to buy power from their supplier of choice and ensure that there's proper competition. And, and we need to enable a system that meets the needs uh, in terms of the term of the of the agreements, as I said earlier on. Further importantly, we need to de-risk the project financing for banks and investors when it comes to, to building this, the plant that we need. And we need to do that, again, by enabling easier off-take diversification, so to reduce reliance on specific counterparty balance sheets, make it easy to have a highly diversified uh, off-take, and, and then also, like for customers, creating a liquid secondary market for short or long-term supply. It's important to think about the system as a whole, and, and that means we need to reduce possible single points of institutional failure in the wheeling system. And importantly, as I mentioned in my introduction, we need to build on the concepts and insights from conventional and virtual wheeling. And our aim is also to comply with ESCOM's wheeling re requirements that are essentially embedded in those, in those systems. So in a nutshell, <clears throat> what is token wheeling? Tokens function as electricity vouchers and proof of power gen generated. So they are vouchers with a monetary value for the settlement of an electricity account. Tokens are generated by injecting power into the grid. All the relevant information about the power is recorded on the token. The meter ID, the location, the generation technology, the timestamp, the carbon emissions, the face value of the token, etc. The token's face value is based on an electricity credit token agreement with a guarantor. Let's assume mostly that it'll be ESCOM. Uh, and the agreement uh, says that the guarantor will honor the token on presentation for the settlement of an electricity account. The token face value is determined by a valuation method agreed with a guarantor. Typically, under the current wheeling arrangements, that would be webs before losses for, uh, if uh, ESCOM is the guarantor. Importantly, tokens are financial assets. They do not represent the ownership of power. End customers can sign up for short or long-term token purchase agreements. Uh, based on their demand for power and the amounts that they would want to redeem against their electricity accounts. Tokens are tradable and can be used to settle obligations in a chain of transactions, some of which might not be related to electricity, before in the final transaction they are presented to the guarantor to be redeemed. And redeeming a token means, uh, with a, redeeming it with a guarantor, means the bearer's electricity account is credited for the token face value, and the token is cancelled. <clears throat> so here's a diagram that's in our report uh, that demonstrates this, this concept. So we can perhaps start with uh, the IPP and the buyer. So the IPP and the buyer, where the buyer kind of acts as the aggregator or a trader or a large corporate uh, buying power from large scale, you know, from large scale IPPs. They would, uh, they would ne negotiate uh, something that's a, a, a power procurement agreement, a, typical, a kind of a pretty reasonable, normal corporate power procurement agreement. Um, and the buyer would have the financial obligation to pay the IPP for the, for the power. Uh, of course, in terms of the uh, PPA and uh, under conditions, we'll, we'll talk about the agreements with ESCOM, but part of this, uh, well, let's put it this way, the buyer uses the power uh, to generate electricity credit tokens. So the tokens are generated as the power is injected into the grid by an independent service pro provider that complies with the requirements and criteria set by, by the guarantor, ESCOM. So the buyer then ends up receiving this uh, stream of tokens, which of course it then sells to customers in, who are located in any participating dis distributor. The customers receive their normal electricity account from the distributor. There's nothing changes in how they build. However, when it comes to paying their account or settling their account, 
because the distributors agreed to participate in the system, uh, the settlement of the electricity account can be done with tokens in addition to cash. So you can use both and or probably use them in, use them in com combination. The, the distributors in effect will then aggregate the tokens they receive and of course can do the same on their electricity bulk account with ESCOM, right? So they can then finally redeem their tokens with ESCOM, get credited on their bulk accounts with ESCOM and, and get the full, get the same benefit. Now, of course, this doesn't actually have to be done by distributors or the customer or even ESCOM. All of the, the transactions can be managed by service providers. You can refer to it as a virtual wheeling platform on behalf of a buyer or whatever. So uh, customers could even hand over the, the management of the electricity accounts to a service provider, the buyer, say, who would manage this, this process on their behalf and, and settle their electricity account with cash and tokens and, and just invoice them for, for the net amount that they have to pay. So that is essentially uh, at a high level how it works. Of course, uh, a number of agreements will have to be set up to make this work. The primary commercial structure will be established by a key, a number of key agreements. However, the, the foundation for the whole set of agreements uh, will be a standardized uh, guarantor or distributor ECT agreement. So it's the agreement, uh, uh, the way we thought of it is between the buyer and, and the guarantor, in this case, ESCOM, will be a ECT agreement, a, a, sorry, a guarantor ECT agreement. And the agreement between the distributor and the buyer will be a distributor ECT agreement. And they, they will be quite similar in nature. The, the agreements must specify the conditions for issuing, for the issuing of the tokens, in this case, on behalf of the guarantor. The parties, uh, to the, uh, must agree to the redeemable value of the tokens for the settlement of electricity accounts. Uh, they must, uh, the utilities must allow implementation uh, of the credits, creating of accounts via the payment, via payment service providers that are actually already in place for cash payments. And of course, they, they need to agree to specific data exchange and reporting re requirements. This is just a very high level sense of what will have to be uh, captured in these agreements. So let's talk um, a bit about the, the benefits. And, and, yeah, and I mean, as you can see, I've only given a really high level overview of the concepts and there are many more details to be, to be unpacked. But let's think about the benefits. Let's start with... Um, with projects themselves that will have to be providing the power because that's ultimately what we're what we're after. Of course, uh, the whole uh, design aim was that uh, improved wheeling in this case, the token system must enhance the bankability of projects, and we think it does. It, it will achieve this primarily, for instance, compared to virtual wheeling, it will avoid the double payment uh, for power and the need to extract cash from municipalities and then from from ESCOM because it works on a crediting system. So in this way, it almost has the same, it achieves the same uh, uh, outcome as uh, almost as an escrow system would do. So because you, you actually ensure that the cash, uh, you know, goes where it should go and you, you, you don't hand it over to in intermediaries who ultimately needs to repay the cash over to third parties. Secondly, um, uh, the liquidity of trading significantly reduces both the supply for supply risk for customers and the offtake risk for uh, for projects. So that's that's really uh, really important. It also the system will lower barriers to entry, so there'll be more players in the markets, uh, and again con con contributes to liquidity. It eliminates the need for NERSA licenses, and we can come back to this in the discussion because you are not dealing with electricity, you're dealing with a, with a fun, financial asset. And overall, in our view, it reduces the, the legal compliance risk and therefore the risk to um, projects. What this also does is it sets up uh, the the private power, you know, there is risk for long-term projects that will ultimately have to survive in a market where there's a formal uh, power market, uh, as we see in the ERA bill, the Electricity Regulatory uh, Amendment Bill. So what this system does is it starts setting up the trading of, of uh, power-related uh, rights and obligations in a way that makes it an easy to segue into a, into a com competitive market and therefore de-risks investing in projects now. 
Secondly, a very important benefit is that this is a, we think, a simpler implementation model than some of the other models. Firstly, we can piggyback on existing payment systems into, into distributors and into ESCOM. Uh, because it, uh, it and it avoids implementing the system in the billing system. It only needs to be affected through the payment system, and that already exists. And there are already many third-party payment providers that can that can do this. So you avoid cost of supply studies from municipalities, wheeling fee negotiations, policy changes uh, with municipalities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Secondly, and this is an interesting and maybe a somewhat controversial point, um, this system does not require immediate installation um, of time of use meters for customers because they actually get their power from the existing distributor. The, the power supply arrangements don't change. Uh, and it also does not <clears throat> require um, monthly time of use reconciliation between generation and loads. There is reconciliation that happens between uh, ESCOM on the normal box. Well, ESCOM charges their the customers, the box supply customers on the webs, you know, on the um, Megaflex tariff. But there's no need for monthly reconciliation between the generation and the loads because this is not a power trading system. It is a financial uh, settlement system. So the system can deliver this. It can deliver in applications where it's necessary uh, uh, matching or between demand and supply but it's not necessary to do this uh, and it can be eliminated entirely um, and that of course it makes it a significantly easier and faster system to implement for customers of course uh, uh, the, the system now has significant benefits particularly because of its extended reach uh, many more customers in urban areas can meet their price hedging needs and also their de decarbonization uh, obligations and needs. Uh, and the price uh, hedging mechanism works the same as for other wheeling models. Um, it's not the um, monthly tokens that gives you the hedge, it's the token procurement agreement, the, long, the term agreement to procure tokens uh, at a on a particular price path. Uh, so this is the equivalent of a PPA um, in, a, in a wheeling situation with respect to the hedge that it provides. Token, the token system has important benefits for ESCOM. Uh, it, of course, facilitates additional and faster expansion of generation capacity onto the grid. And with no additional impact on ESCOM's balance sheet or requirement for government guarantees. And this is really important, right? We, we, private power faces a real challenge to have credit, by, um, credit with the off off takers. But because we are giving investors access to a large, diversified, liquid offtake market. It really should de-risk the investment and, and then complete and really have a direct relationship between the final users of power and then the investors in the projects that generate the power, removing most of the intermediaries, de-risk the system and save the sovereign and ESCOM balance sheets from having to, to address that, that, that issue. So this is an important opportunity. Because uh, of additional uh, generation capacity coming on at faster rates and larger scale, we ESCOM will save uh, on diesel-fired generation costs. It will reduce uh, the cycling of its pump storage assets, which will save it further costs. And it, uh, as it gets the system operator gets um, more confidence in the availability of power to recharge the pump storage assets, they'll be able to use the capacity of those assets to a much larger extent. Currently, they only use about 25% of the pump storage capacity because they need to keep the rest in reserve. Um, a further benefit for ESCOM is it doesn't need to run most of the system. Uh, uh, the external, uh, we'll talk about this a bit more, but the external virtual wheeling platforms can do most of the heavy, heavy lifting. ESCOM and other entities that are participating only need to allow the implementation into its payment system. This, of course, importantly, also reduces ESCOM's exposure to municipal non-payment. This is a huge issue and of great concern to ESCOM. Um, as token wheeling uptake increases, ESCOM's exposure to non-payment by municipal distributors on their bulk electricity bills will reduce. Uh, and, uh, you know, municipalities can't uh, use tokens for anything else other than setting ultimately the, their ESCOM bill. So that is, it had, that is that protection mechanism that you that you get with that municipalities will also benefit uh, and potentially significantly at uh, 
at least they will remain revenue neutral, but they'll also protect their sales. Um, token wheeling, particularly with its larger reach, will, will protect municipal sales volumes and the margins that they make thereon. Customers that, uh, the municipal customers that are hedging themselves with tokens, with the, the, the token supply agreement, will of course be able to contain the input costs in, uh, and continue buying municipal power. They will decarbonize their power and also continue buying their power from the, from the municipality. And this of course will give municipal customers uh, ongoing incentive to maintain or even grow their grid-based power for con con consumption. And this in turn protects the sales volumes and the margins they make by selling power. So that's the volume point. There's a separate point and that is the price point. If, um, if customers are price hedged on their input costs, uh, this gives municipalities uh, room to maintain their margins as the input cost the, the to municipalities increases uh, because their customers are actually not exposed to the full input cost increases from, from ESCOM. So this is really important for municipalities. There are, uh, and this is uh, on, the, on the medium term, medium to longer term, uh, one of the best options we see there is for them to protect their to protect their margins. Um, so I'm getting uh, I'm going quite fast here. I'm actually surprised. Um, I'm getting um, uh, close to the end. But let me talk about other ap uh, applications for uh, for mar other market applications. So for instance, once you set up a token system, there are actually many many ways in which it can be used. Uh, here's, a, here's one example. For instance, rather than going through the complex, painful process of establishing municipal feed-in tariffs for rooftop solar systems, uh, why can't we use the token system to, to, to a, a, a achieve this, right? So currently, all, many of us that have household systems or even commercial systems know that a lot of the power is being curtailed and wasted at a time when we have load shedding. However, uh, as an example, one can see that um, the financiers of these rooftop systems that are in the market running you know, the, the rollout of these systems, they can, for instance, offer to purchase the tokens generated from the excess power from their customers and either sell it back to their customers to settle their own accounts, or they could simply uh, uh, sell it to, to third parties. So by buying the excess power, you literally are monetizing all of the power that can be uh, generated by the PV installation, uh, which will of course in dramatically increase the bankability of projects and grow the finances loan, loan books as the rollout in in increases. So that's just one example. Um, there is a, a further option is, for instance, let's say we, we would like to get going with that and there are a couple of municipalities, one or two municipalities who are ready to, to go proceed with um, a pilot project. Uh, but perhaps ESCOM is not quite ready to implement token wheeling. Well, it's always possible to combine uh, uh, two wheeling systems. So for instance, one can use conventional wheeling to get the power from the IPP on the ESCOM grid to, to the municipality, and the municipality will get the credit in its actual account uh, implemented by ESCOM in terms of the conventional wheeling rules. And then, of course, the buyer of the power could then at that point take over with a token wheeling model and uh, proceed, as I've just explained, to sell tokens to customers and then um, use the tokens to as credit on customers' uh, accounts with the municipality. In that case, the guarantor would be uh, the municipality, not, not ESCOM. A further opportunity, for instance, is where in, uh, many uh, large industrial customers, of course, have to curtail their demand during load shedding, which is a huge problem. Uh, for, for them because they can't generate enough power on site or often to, to do this. Uh, but there are often opportunities to generate power off site and even create a market for curtailment, for dispatchable curtailment power. Tokens can be used to, to track and aggregate this power and to sell this to, to, uh, to customers that need to curtail. A further important opportunity and potentially enormous opportunity is that vendors of prepayment electricity can uh, simply plug in the, the token wheeling into the prepayment system. So let's say you're a large bank, financial institution, or any other vendor of uh, prepayment power, you buy tokens, and when your customers come to buy prepayment electricity, they have a choice. You can buy normal electricity, or you can buy 
uh, real electricity or electricity of any flavor uh, that you've uh, uh, essentially gained the, the rights to through your token system and you've procured the tokens and uh, and they get sold their normal prepayment tokens and uh, which they you know, put into the meter and they get their power and then the vendor of course needs to settle with the distributor kind of the escom or the municipality and they then will do that the normal way they will settle with a combination of the tokens and cash so this is potentially this can literally unlock quite quickly uh, access to all customers on prepayment system and there are still further examples that, that we can that we can think of so what are the key points that we're trying to get across the first is creating a liquid market for electricity related rights and obligations will be the key to de-risk and unlock much wider customer uptake of and accelerated investment in grid-based private power in, in South Africa. I think this is the, one of our key points. So, so token wheeling is not just about wheeling. It's about uh, creating a liquid market for power and de-risking investment. That's the, uh, one of the key points. And th that's why token wheeling enhances the bankability of projects because it reduces the, the serial payment risk that we have with virtual wheeling, reduces implementation risk, removes NERSA licensing requirements, and the need to uh, change electricity uh, supply agreements, etc. It also has a simpler implementation model. We do not need um, intervention in the billing systems. We do, do not need lo a large new utility systems to be developed with the power utilities. This can be done by the private sector. It unlocks generation capacity without adding financial pressure onto the public sector, critical. It protects municipal sales volumes and margins. And of course, it extends the financial hedging and decarbonization benefits to a broader customer range. So lastly, our proposals, what are the next steps? We essentially see that there should be a stakeholder driven task team supporting uh, supporting and reporting into uh, NUCOM 9 that would drive the, the uh, adoption and development of the ECT system. So given the limited resources at ESCOM and municipalities and their high workload, we propose that a single point of engagement with government and utilities should be established on the Workstream 9. This is important. Um, we, we don't see this being developed by municipalities or ESCOM. I think the current wheeling system and how long it's taking is a good example of that. We need a different model. Businesses and other uh, other stakeholders with an interest in implementing the ECT system could drive the work in collaboration with ESCOM and willing municipalities under NUCOM leadership. The aims would be to develop firstly a detailed set of principles describing the national functionality of the ECT system or the token wheeling system. Secondly, the standardized, uh, we need to develop the standardized ECT agreements with the guarantors, mostly ESCOM and the distributors, mostly municipalities. Thirdly, of course, we will then have to develop the common technical standards for its implementation. And this is going to be critical that it's common because ultimately we need a national market in tokens. Last point is the necessary and competing platforms to implement this and to implement things like token management, reporting, trading, et cetera, et cetera, will have to be developed by business. So colleagues, that's our presentation. Uh, we are looking forward to further input from, from yourselves. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Hruvia, uh, for that insightful presentation. Um, colleagues, you've all got the paper, the full paper, and I think you've had a bit of context now, uh, which kind of, I hope, will break the ice in reading a complex document. Uh, it is a complex subject, but when I listen to the benefits, uh, it, they seem to have a very powerful set of benefits uh, that uh, uh, makes this uh, really something that has to be look that further. But uh, I, I want to hear what uh, ESCOM, uh, what the financial sector, what the legal sector, and what, uh, you know, uh, traders have to think about this. So the first respondent uh, to the paper by um, uh, by Kruvia is uh, Mondi Bala, who is the managing director of ESCOM distribution. And his task is to prepare the utility as a distribution business in a restructured electricity distribution industry and future energy markets. 
So this is really up his street. Uh, he's driving the modernization of the distribution grid and retail services while setting up the first distribution system operator and distribution energy trader, uh, ensuring that Eskom distribution remains at the very forefront of industry's transformation. Mondi's expertise in strategic planning and network planning and operations, project management, network engineering, and network design has been acquired over a 25-year career at Eskom. He's a registered professional engineer with a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering from the UCT, and he has a Master's degree in Industrial Engineering from Wits University. So it's a great pleasure now to hand over to uh, Mondi uh, for his response uh, to the proposals uh, by Hrubia Stein and Meridian Economics. Over to you, uh, Mondi. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I appreciate uh, this opportunity. I just want to share my screen. Uh, Thank you. Please confirm if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. If you can put it into full screen mode. Okay. It should be full screen now. Uh, just one second while it comes on. I can't see it yet. Yes. Uh, it's not in full screen mode, uh, Monday. Uh, it's, uh, but um, we can see it. Uh, if you want to proceed, just proceed. Otherwise, try put it in full screen mode. Uh, let me try. Uh, yes. Yeah, let me try. My apologies. No problem, Monday. It was working so well <laughs> when we were when we preparing. Okay, I think yeah. let, 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 let's just say in terms of time, uh, I think let's let's get going. Yeah, thank you, sure. Chris, uh, once more uh, yeah, for this opportunity. And uh, thanks uh, uh, to Javier uh, for uh, the, the paper with the, with the proposal. I think it's a, it's a great uh, sort of uh, yeah, uh, point to take off from. Uh, uh, if I may, just in terms of overview, uh, so the really as a concept, it, it is not new to ESCOM. It is something that uh, ESCOM has been uh, implementing. We have a policy uh, since uh, the late uh, 2000s, uh, around 2008, when the first reading uh, contract was, was, was put in place. Yeah, that is, uh, uh, we migrated that. Uh, to you know, collaboration with uh, with Vodacom and much publicized the virtual reading uh, within platform that we're currently working on with Vodacom. Uh, so that that is where we are. Uh, we I think the collaboration with 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 Vodacom they came to us and said uh, they would like to uh, they've got a strategy that talks to them cleaning their operations. Uh, so we then started on this journey. Uh, it was a journey of over a year to get to a point whereby we were now comfortable uh, to say that it's 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 a concept that can work in this virtual meeting. Uh, so where we are, just as an update, uh, we uh, are working on putting uh, the platform in place uh, before the end of 2024. And so from the time that we have actually agreed with Vodacom uh, on, the, on the concept itself to the time that the platform is going to be placed. So it took another year. So the whole thing took, uh, is going to take uh, more or less about two years. So the point is, uh, these are complex matters uh, that require time and require caution as you, as you move. Uh, so uh, we ourselves, uh, we see the uh, ESCOM uh, and ESCOM distribution in particular, as actually pivotal in, in the whole energy sector and the whole uh, energy ecosystem. So as we unbundle, let's come into the three different uh, entities, namely uh, generation, transmission, and distribution. Uh, we need to focus on making sure that uh, uh, the, the grid and grid services uh, remain at the center of what we do. And that uh, whatever uh, sort of concepts that we put in place, uh, the sanctity of the grid uh, needs to be maintained because at the end of the day, we can have all the reading agreements that we want. Uh, we can have all the PPAs. Uh, if there is no grid, then there is no, there is no energy ecosystem. So as we're transforming this energy, this energy sector, yeah, we want to uh, 
what we want to do with our share in front of it is strong and the sustainable energy landscapes, the landscape for the future, and also to help our customers to uh, keep up uh, with, uh, with their own requirements. So we are focused mainly on, on efficiency, innovation, and uh, on, 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 on being customer-centric uh, while we pave the way for a sustainable energy future. But again, at the center of it is, is, is the whole issue about the grid. So uh, we, in terms of the concept itself, uh, it, it's quite innovative. It, it is welcome and uh, it is uh, really a uh, good uh, sort of point to, to take off from. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, it, it is still at a concept uh, stage and that uh, there will be further work uh, that will be required uh, to make sure that it is uh, it, 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 that, that uh, it can be uh, broadly implemented. Uh, I think even regards to our own journey uh, on the virtual wheeling uh, uh, concept and then virtual wheeling platform. So yeah, we, 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 we've got a, say, some idea as to the amount of work that, uh, uh, that uh, is required to, to make this a reality. So uh, we support the initiative. Uh, we believe that it will unlock a greater distributed generation and investment in, 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 the, in the energy landscape. And that in itself will actually help in uh, resolving the energy crisis that the country is, uh, that the country is facing. Uh, we do acknowledge though that uh, the, uh, the element of uh, risk and how that is apportioned throughout the value chain uh, is things that we need to uh, to make sure that uh, they are well considered uh, in, 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 in developing this concept. So we see virtual meeting uh, uh, as a concept, as really a, a serious game changer uh, in in how the the energy market evolves. And we need uh, we have to make sure that we do all in our power to roll it out uh, so that we can actually see. Uh, and unlock the value that is that is that is, uh, that, is uh, that the concept promises. So, uh, in our understanding, the basis of this concept is, is really to, to mitigate uh, the customers, the, the the independent power producers, uh, and 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 also the distributors uh, of which ESCOM is one of the distributors, uh, municipalities and other distributors. Uh, but the whole issue of the cash flow risk here, uh, we, we need to make sure that we deal with those uh, with those issues. Uh, again, having the understanding that uh, the grid will remain at the center because at the end of the day, distributors need to make sure that there is a grid and that uh, whoever is using the grid uh, must make sure that uh, we need to ensure that uh, they uh, they contribute uh, appropriately uh, to the maintenance of this, uh, this grid. So just from a, a, a South African landscape point of view, we've got uh, close to 240 municipalities uh, in, 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 the, in the country. Uh, not all the municipalities are in debt uh, and cannot sell their accounts in full. And we thought that is, a, that, that is an important point to make. Uh, about 60% of the municipalities are actually in this journey. So technically, uh, this then uh, makes uh, uh, yeah, this task uh, quite easy, easier, uh, but we do take note that uh, this situation is actually quite volatile, and that uh, yeah, we'll, uh, a municipality in good standing today uh, can that can change overnight. So it is important that we make sure that we safeguard, yeah, we put the adequate safeguards uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we, the concept on its own uh, does uh, uh, is actually robust. So uh, just to confirm that uh, we, uh, under uh, NICO Westream 9, uh, of which I'm, uh, I'm chairing, uh, we have undertaken this work, uh, deal with the issue of the municipal debt, uh, and as an impediment to this uh, to this wheeling uh, concept, we are currently, uh, we have finalized the wheeling framework that is currently with the regulator uh, for, for consideration. So uh, all of this work is being uh, undertaken uh, within that NICOM uh, sort of remit. So uh, uh, again, just carrying on on the, on the concept itself, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we 
have got an objective analysis uh, to, uh, to 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 ensure that uh, uh, at the end of the day that uh, those uh, uh, tokens can be honored by either party. Uh, so uh, we are looking at uh, uh, this is a concept. We'll, uh, so we'll have to piggyback on existing systems and business processes uh, because uh, again we need to build on what is working. So the, the the concept itself is highly dependent on technology in our uh, in our uh, view, and uh, just uh, from a technology point of view, we uh, sort of uh, assign this to, to 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 the equivalent of a blockchain technology. And uh, looking at that, and that being its infancy, so yeah, we really have to uh, spend a bit of time to see how that will work. Uh, I also must uh, hasten to, uh, to 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 indicate that uh, the bulk of the distributors, uh, mainly in municipalities, or well, not the bulk, uh, some municipalities, uh, their systems uh, and infrastructure uh, will require some serious upgrade to be able to take advantage of this uh, concept as a as a concept. So the industry standards uh, need to uh, end the monitoring because at the end of the day, uh, we need to make sure that these can be validated. Uh, and uh, so that uh, we can make sure that uh, the, uh, there is uh, some legitimacy to the system. We've got regulatory requirements uh, uh, that we need to comply to. So the, yeah, the job of the, of the regulator, uh, they, they, they've got the work uh, cut up uh, for them uh, to make sure that this is the reality. So uh, yeah, we need to just make sure that uh, in terms of uh, the alignment with the existing uh, building systems, uh, because yeah, this thing requires significant investment and also time to make sure that they work properly. So uh, again, those are some of the considerations that as an entity we uh, would have to consider. So in terms of the concept as a financial instrument, we need to make sure that we, we test this against the uh, against the requirements uh, of the financial standards and also the uh, uh, with the auditor general from municipalities. So I think the issue of the uh, guarantor, uh, we will need to uh, spend a bit of time on the issue of the guarantor. Who is a guarantor and what form of guarantees that the guarantor must provide? And, and, and. so I think uh, those are some of the issues that. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, spend a bit of time. And then any other risks uh, that uh, we uh, that, 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 that may come up, uh, specifically uh, that includes the, the likes of municipalities. So this is a picture that was uh, shown by Slope, where we've identified the areas that uh, just need uh, uh, us to spend a bit of time on. We've been through the paper. We, uh, I think we, we do have uh, uh, some questions that will have to be clarified. Uh, then obviously we need to take this as part of the ecom uh, sort of work that uh, that will then further unpack. So, but we've identified the particular areas that that will be required in terms of the relationship between uh, the, the 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 virtual reading platform itself and ESCOM and and other distributors, the relationship between uh, the platform and and the end customers, because in certain instances uh, in our uh, vantage point, the buyer is the customer. So uh, somehow we just need to uh, make sure that we, uh, we, we, are, we are on the same page in terms of understanding. Uh, just by uh, way of conclusion, uh, so we support this proposal and then we recommend that uh, we, uh, we, this, we take it through the link of streams. And yeah, we recognize this uh, as, as, as an opportunity in unblocking uh, some of the uh, challenges that the traditional reading uh, uh, reading framework is uh, has. So, but uh, it, we need to make sure that it is a, a step up. Uh, we support uh, the blockchain technology, but uh, we need to understand that uh, where where we are as as a country with, with the matter such as blockchain, uh, we're still uh, it's still a bit in its infancy. So, uh, yeah, the, the uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Stein made the point that uh, for this to work, uh, all the stakeholders within the value chain needs to 
uh, needs to be aligned. Uh, so that's going to be important. So, uh, but yeah, also uh, just on the timing issue, uh, again, having uh, the experience that we have with, with Vodacom, and we do know that some of the work that we did with Vodacom can be done in shorter time frames. However, we, uh, we are of the view that uh, as complex as matters are, uh, yeah, but they, they do take a bit of time uh, to, uh, to get around. Uh, more specifically because of the uh, number of the stakeholders within the value chain. So uh, yeah, uh, that uh, yeah, that this uh, basically requires a, a, a bit more further work. Uh, but I think uh, overall uh, uh, we're happy for the innovation. Uh, it sounds great as a concept, but yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day the devil will be in the detail. Uh, Chris, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that is my concluding remark. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mondi, for that feedback and response. Uh, obviously, ESKIM is integral to this matter. It is the guarantor, as you mentioned, and as Khrubim mentioned, and uh, your chairmanship of um, uh, Workstream 9 at NECOM, I think, uh, puts you in a position where you can play a very significant role uh, in uh, establishing the viability and the rollout of, of, of this uh, mechanism. Anyway, thanks very much for that, Mondi. And it's now my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Vincenzia Leitich, uh, who is an executive at uh, Standard Bank, uh, responsible for energy and infrastructure. Um, Vincenzia has over 14 years of risk and investment banking and project finance and debt structuring experience, <laughs> uh, including energy and infrastructure product projects across South and Sub-Saharan Africa in various asset classes such as renewable energy, gas, water, hospitals, border posts, and various funding structures, including export credit agency and risk mitigation enhancements. Vincenzi has led many of the recently closed South African uh, renewable energy IPP program uh, and decentralized energy projects, and uh, she is now involved in a more sector-focused role where key aspects include a focus on private power and the power developments in the South Africa space, as well as thought leadership and specific structural innovation. Well, I can't think of anybody better to talk about this. Uh, if you're responsible for structural innovation and thought leadership, um, uh, I'm very pleased that we've got you on board, Vincenzia. So I'm going to uh, hand over to you now and ask you to uh, share your presentation, which I see you have done. And over to you, Vincenzia. Thanks a lot, Chris. And good afternoon, everybody. Just checking you can hear me. So my discussion today will focus, first of all, on key developments that we've seen in the power sector space in South Africa. Then we'll go on to some of the bankability views on current wheeling frameworks. And then finally, obviously key, discuss the ECT credit token concept, some views around that, some considerations. So just quickly, um, for those of you who don't know, Standard Bank is the largest bank for assets on the continent. And as a bank, we are committed to driving the sustainable development of our continent. Standard Bank has been a lead participant and funder in the renewable and power sector in South Africa, both in the government procured projects and in the de decentralized private power space in South Africa. So just quickly to touch on some key developments that we've seen in the private power space and you know, this is obviously very relevant to the discussion today around wheeling and opening up of the market. Um, we've all, we're all aware, obviously, of the energy crisis in South Africa, and we've seen an acceleration of development in the power market over the past few months. From a utility scale perspective, South Africa has seen some significant advancements in recent years, and this was started by the government um, power program procurement program, REAP, et cetera, and changes to the regulatory regime governing private power generation the last few years, which has definitely resulted in a lot of growth in the sector. This was initially driven by high intensive energy users issuing RFPs on a bilateral PPA basis, both on a behind the meter power generation, but now more commonly there's a need to wheel power due to the lack of adequate space at, at off taker sites. The market has banked wheel projects where the generator and the off taker are both ESCOM connected, 
and the power generated is wheeled across the grid. And this has predominantly been done on a bilateral basis. But now what we're seeing in the market is an emergence of aggregators and traders in the power space, also driven by regulatory reforms, as well as the need for flexibility of off takers in terms of PPA requirements, tenors, and also the ability for smaller scale energy users to also procure green power on a real basis. For the full potential of aggregators and trader models to be reached, the ability to wheel power to multiple off takers, including off takers within munis, there's definitely a need to have wheeling frameworks across munis, which is consistent, robust, and comprehensive. And this currently isn't the case. Um, current wheeling frameworks are not really designed to easily facilitate more complex many-to-many -many arrangements, which is more sort of the aggregated trade model. There are wheeling pilots in, for example, City of Cape Town and Nelson Mandela Bay, which we are watching closely. Unlocking this wheeling framework will assist as traditional Eskom to Eskom wheeling has largely been designed to service large consumers of electricity and getting this muni framework right will be a huge unlock as obviously a large percentage of energy users, including small to medium sized off takers are located behind munis. So just moving on to key bankability requirements, and obviously there, there are lots, so I'm only going to focus on a few which are relevant. Um, one of the most important ones are key bankabilities for, key bankability requirement is to have a binding offtake agreement or a power purchase agreement at an agreed price and tenor. And this is obviously very important to ensure certainty of revenue streams. And um, this is especially important for projects where we're looking to fund with long term tenors, sometimes 20 years. The ability to deliver electricity from generator at a predictable, predictable cost and structure. And this is important to ensure that the costs are known and there's limited risk in any changes to this, which would ultimately affect the ability to service debt unless passed on to, for example, the off taker understanding how the wheeling will work for the project is key as this is the link between the generator and the off taker that will make private investment in utility scale generation feasible and to ensure that revenue streams are protected and for the project to move forward often definitive accounting protocols and systems potentially meeting is also metering is also required and you know, the above requirements point to the bankability requirements for a comprehensive, robust, and predictable wheeling regulatory free framework to be in place. I think also importantly, including tariffs and use of system charges. And all of this will encourage a network of multiple private generators selling to multiple off takers with the ability to wheel into munis. So just to touch on briefly what we've seen, um, some of the challenges when it's come to looking at, at wheeling into municipalities and different wheeling frameworks. So Eskom to Eskom, traditional wheeling has been banked on quite a few private power transactions to date. And this works because traditional wheeling is a credit system where Eskom credits the buyer's bill for the electricity delivered to the buyer, but not supplied by the S by Eskom at the end of each month. So there's therefore no reliance on Eskom to actually make a physical payment. Market players are familiar with the required documentation, including amendments to the electricity supply agreement and the requirement for the generator to enter into a use of system agreement. So key issues when looking at current proposed virtual wheeling and muni wheeling include wheeling frameworks are not nimble enough to allow for easy reallocation of power across multiple off takers. Um, this leads to implementation risk, which is obviously bankability concern. There is a credit risk and bankability concern when there is an Eskimo muni payment and obviously the fact that the off taker has to make a double payment. Um, this is unlikely to be palatable for an off taker and would ultimately lead to a potential bankability concern. It also, because the municipality has to be in a good, in a good standing with Eskom, it limits the potential off takers as they are restricted to be located in specific good standing municipalities. There's a lack of standardization, another key point for bankability. 
and municipal billing, billing systems may not cater for specific wheeling tra transactions where it's a many to many um, type of, of arrangement. So all of this makes um, wheeling into munis, current municipal frameworks quite challenging. So now just to focus more on the electricity credit token concept, and I'm going to run through some of the benefits and advantages that we would see um, on the ECT system. And then I'm going to run through some bankability considerations, which would require a little bit more um, consideration and thought on. So the first one, obviously, is that the ECT concept credit re reduces the credit risk which is, as mentioned, quite a, a big bankability concern um, in the current sort of virtual wheeling framework. So here we're not taking risk on Eskim and Muni making actual payments. The concern or requirement around a Muni being in good standing is also removed. The ECT concept retains the ability to enter into long-term power purchase agreements with off-takers, and the off-taker can be assessed for credit worthiness on a standalone basis without having to consider any other payment risks. There's also an increased ability for flexibility for the ultimate end user as the token purchase agreement or TPA can cater for specific end user nuances, such as different tenor requirements, um, you know, potentially shorter than what we've seen as the, the standard 20 year PPA agreement and also flexibility on the energy demand requirements. So all of those are quite powerful for an off taker. The ECT concept could also potentially reduce the risk of TPA end user defaults, as if the TPA holders demand requirements change, they do have the ability to trade with, the, with um, an ECT with another off taker, which does assist in bankability, um, because it would ensure that there's a TPA revenue flow. I think all of that being said, some of the, the key points to, to look into and consider is and this has been mentioned by Grave, there is a requirement for an industry-wide technical standard for credit tokens to ensure that the tokens are credible, tradable, and recognized. And how long will it take this to happen? How will this be implemented? Is there feasibility for a pilot or a proof of concept and then a wider scale rollout? Another key item would be to unpack from a bankability perspective any implications in, in terms of legal, regulatory, and policy considerations and any resulting findings. And I think we will be getting into that in a bit more detail later on. The virtual wheeling platform entity will be key to the success. So who will this entity be? And we would most likely require an enhanced due diligence around capability, potential security requirements or guarantees, any recourse to that entity and the ability for that entity to be replaced if needed. Will there be other entities in the market who could step into the place and implications of that in terms of timing and costs? We'd also need to unpack and the implications of the tariff. So to the extent there are extra fees payable to the VWP and implications thereof. So ultimately, there's always a pressure to try and keep the electricity tariff at a reasonable rate, and any additional fees could jeopardize this. The ECT, or ECT guarantor agreement terms must be enforceable, and it's up key, obviously, that the ECT is verifiable and auditable. And one of the points to consider is if an ECT is not honored, will there be recourse and to whom? Would the recourse be to the VWP entity if the ECT is not credible or to the ECT guarantor if the ECT is not honored. So ultimately, this will need to be unpacked as it could leave the generator or the primary off taker in difficulty and therefore a potential bankability concern. I think also key is the tenor of that ECT guarantor agreement. Will it be 20 years? Will it be for longer? Um, and, and that's something to consider as well. Considerations around the need for ECT guarantor agreements to be back to back with the distrib distributor ECT agreements so that the standards are consistent throughout. Um, also considerations of the structure of the power purchase agreement and the TPA and whether or not some form of back to back is required for certain risk allocations, for example, force majeure, network event, 
And will ECTs be honored to the extent electricity is put into the grid by the generator, but the grid is down? The question is, will that ECT be honored by the ECT guarantor? And I think this point becomes quite relevant in the context of some of the curtailment discussions that are ongoing. Initially, funding terms for structures using this ECT token may reflect the newness of the system. However, as with most things, once track record is developed and once there is market buy-in and adoption, this could change to reflect the buy-in and reliability of the ECT token system. It is recognized that the token system does allow for the ability for flexibility in TPA terms by the TPA customers and ability for TPA customers to trade ECTs. However, my view is that for initial stages, this would likely be limited as funders would most likely in the early stages want to know who the TPA customers are to ensure that the generator off is paid to ultimately be able to pay the generator. So there would still be some need for due diligence initially on the TPA customers and management of the TPA customer profile will also be necessary to ensure the business model of the generator off is robust. Once a liquid market of ECTs is established, this requirement would most likely be reduced and there would be more flexibility. So just to sum up, I think there's, there's a lot of appetite for the sector and for funding renewable energy projects, but there isn't a lot of activity in the sector and there is an oversupply of these sorts of assets. There isn't an oversupply of these sorts of assets closing in the market. There is a large demand for renewable energy assets from commercial banks, from institutional investors, or looking at initiatives to mobilize different sources of capital to fund these projects. So I think as the sector is evolving and looking at all of these new innovative ideas, it's key. And to pick up on risk and structuring issues or perspectives is essential. So banks can, that are used to doing things in a certain way are open to innovation in order to support the sector and to unlock some of the issues that they're facing at the moment. So, so that's it in conclusion. I think a few points to consider there and, and back to you, Chris. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Vincenzia. Uh, and I just want to uh, just touch on a point um, we talked about, uh, you, you know, when Monday's slides were shared, uh, but there was a problem um, in, in the transitioning of the slides. I just want to assure everybody uh, that uh, shortly after this webinar, all the slide decks will be shared with all the people that registered to attend this event. So uh, sorry that there was a technical glitch there, uh, but you will receive the slide decks of all of the uh, presenters. So uh, Vincenzia has given us uh, some uh, insights uh, from a financial institution's perspective, uh, and I think they'll be very valuable. And I'm sure they do participate on these NECOM work streams. Um, and we've got to get um, her insights um, in, into this process. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to have a five-minute um, uh, comfort break. Uh, we had planned it for minutes, uh, but um, the time is short, and we've overrun the time a little bit. So I, I would like to suggest uh, it's now nearly a quarter past one, uh, uh, 13, 15 nearly. Uh, can we meet back at... Um, uh, 13, um, 20, 13, 20. Actually, that gives us seven minutes uh, comfort break. Uh, if that's uh, suitable to everybody, uh, please don't go away. Um, and uh, there's a lot uh, more to come, including the poll at the end of the um, uh, at, at the end, end of the wrap up by Atvana Merva, uh, which is really important to get uh, your feedback about the next steps and um, who is able to participate and who wants to participate in this um, initiative uh, for for uh, token wheeling. Uh, but now it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce you to our next presenter, who is uh, Alexandra Felekis. Uh, she is a legal counsel at the noted um, legal company, Allen & Overy. Um, Alexandra focuses on project and infrastructure finance, particularly as it relates to concessions, procurement programs, public-private partnerships, and financing in the mining and energy sector. Uh, she was part of the team advising the South African government on its Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program, the REAP program, and over the last few years has honed in her skill set in the ever-growing private sector and captive off-grid uh, power market, both in South Africa and on the continent. 
She's acted for uh, both off-takers and independent power producers in the space. Uh, Alexandra has also advised Transnet, South Africa's rail, port and pipeline company, in respect of various concessions. Her expertise has been recognized by Legal 500. Uh, so with that, uh, I have pleasure in asking Alexandra to uh, begin her presentation. Uh, over to you, Alexandra. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, really glad to be discussing this subject today um, as an energy lawyer that has facilitated, facilitated the close of the equivalent of 1,680 megawatts um, of private power um, in the last 18 months. Um, and just welcome something that um, is flexible and provides liquidity in the market um, as it relates as it relates to wheeling. Um, so as a starting point, we think that uh, this concept that's being devised um, is could really be a game changer for our sector. Sorry, I'm just struggling to actually move the slide now. Uh, Chris, is it? Okay. Great. Okay. All right, so as a starting point, from our view, do we think that the structure proposed is legally permissible? Um, and the short answer is yes. Um, so what is basically created by the contractual structure that I'll, I'll re-emphasize the diagram in a minute, but Pravia did re refer to it, um, is this enforceable claim is created by contractual undertakings. So as much as in the note, it's referred to as um, a financial instrument, it's not actually a regulated financial instrument. So it doesn't fall under the definition of a financial instrument or financial product um, under our legislation, which is obviously helpful in terms of um, a limit, a limiting any sort of regulatory, regulatory risk related to basically um, the structure of the token. Um, and Kravir was completely right. Um, as an energy lawyer, what is of paramount importance in our view is basically that contractual undertaking that is given by ESCOM and the distributor that if you have this token, I will basically redeem it and you'll get a credit on your electricity account. Um, so what becomes very important there, um, and Vincenzi also rightly noted it, is recourse. So what, what recourse um, does the customer, does the buyer have to the extent that it is not the, the voucher in effect um, cannot actually be used um, against the electricity account. And that will be a key risk and a key gap um, you know, for the market to close off. The structure is per permissible under our um, current electricity regulates, regulatory act. Um, and for those, of, uh, those on the call who are familiar with that, um, you would know that Wheeling is separately governed by um, ESCOM in, term, in terms of its policies and then the municipal distributors um, as well. So it works under our current electricity regulation. Act. It's also permissible under the amendment bill for the Electricity Act. But I do think what's important to just uh, take a moment to note is that it would be a market transaction, okay? Which means that it would fall under the, the realm of the market operator that will sit with that will sit beneath NT will, will sit within NTCA, and then would be subject to the market rules. So whatever is decided now in terms of how virtual wheeling will work will feed into basically the market structure that um, for some of us is still quite it's quite an opaque area until basically the bill is published and there are regulations and market rules. Um, that give us insight into what a, compet a real competitive market looks like. Um, uh, obviously, based on the notes, the extent that it does record all the information um, required in order to redeem or to attain green attributes, we see no reason why that shouldn't be the case. But obviously, in the way that the token is structured, it obviously has to comply with each, each registry's rules or um, objectives in terms of, in, in order to actually be registered and recognized um, as a green attribute. But we don't see that um, as a major hurdle, just obviously something that has to be kept in mind. So rightly so, because there is the sale of an electricity token as opposed to the sale of megawatt or kilowatt hours, it doesn't constitute trading in terms of the current definition of trading in our law, which is the buying and selling of electricity as a commercial activity. But I do want to caveat here that 
Nurse and the, the market operator may still seek to regulate it anyway. Um, and I say that because at the end of the day, what does it do? It basically results in ultimate consumers of energy um, having a lower electricity cost and you know, potentially less liability to ESCOM. So um, I, it's just something that I think that we all just need to note. Um, and interested in what Rabia's view is, is on, on this later. But obviously, when we speak about you know, stakeholder engagement and a task team um, that works with NECOM, um, and I would be the first one to put up my hand, is that obviously there needs to be that sort of engagement with NURSA as well. Okay, so uh, Rabia did quickly take you through this, but um, just because I'm going to delve into each of these agreements um, in a bit more detail in a few moments, I just thought it would be good to give a quick recap. So just starting here by the IPP, what you have is a power purchase agreement with the buyer. Now that's a conventional, um, what you'd call wheeling power purchase agreement. Um, and then after that, the second agreement that, and so here you are buying kilowatt hours. The buyer then buys those kilowatt hours and they are converted by the virtual wheeling platform into the token. So they get created as the energy is generated. Okay, so the tokens exist as the energy is generated, and then they all are automatically sold to the customer under the, the token purchase agreement. So it's the sale of the token that's being bought here. So no longer megawatt hours, no longer kilowatt hours. And then what becomes very important are the agreements here with the distributor and ESCOM, which the guarantor agreements as such, the guarantee agreements, that basically provide an undertaking from the distributor um, that they will pass the credit on the customer's bill because they're doing that off the back of a commitment by ESCOM in that ESCOM will, will credit the distributor um, with the same credit under the electricity supply agreement with ESCOM. Obviously, important here is all these data exchange agreements, and we'll discuss those in a moment too, but important to understand that there's a flow of generation and consumption data throughout this chain, throughout this contractual uh, chain. So obviously the integrity of that system becomes very important in terms of how it's gonna work. Okay, so let's just dive into the PPA first. Okay, so as a starting point, the IPP will still require generation registration from NURSA. The IPP still enters into a QOSA with ESCOM um, or the municipal distributor and would list the buyer now as the offtaker of energy because there wouldn't be obviously the amendment of the electricity supply agreements as we have under conventional wheeling. And in our view, you'd have the same risk allocation as a usual wheeling PPA. And very much you'd be looking at from a bankability and sponsor perspective, the ability of the buyer to pay for the energy. Okay, so that's what's what, what scrutinized and obviously that the, the risk allocation is bankable and fair. Um, what becomes very important at buyer level then is if there's limited credit support at buyer level, then obviously there's more focus into the portfolio of customers, the tenor of the, um, uh, the, the token sale agreements, the ability to pay for those, and very importantly, that, that there actually will be a rebate on this um, at the end of the day. Um, we also think, I mean, it, it's just to note the fact that any sort of damages that would be payable um, by the buyer, that would be payable to the buyer under the under the PPA with the IPP, obviously what you'd be looking at, at then is that loss of value um, for the ECT purchase price down the value chain to the extent that the buyer cannot on-sell the tokens due to a delay or problem with the generator. So the platform agreement, so as I showed you on the diagram a few moments ago, that's entered, that's entered into between the, plat the virtual platform, which can either be established by, as proposed by Corvia, ESCOM with the municipal distributor, um, and then the buyer. And very much that's um, that platform providing a service to the buyer in terms of creating the tokens based on the information that then is fed to the platform. There's also then data exchange agreements with the platform and ESCOM, IPP, buyer and distributor. So information all along the chain. So obviously first thing, when it's exchange of information on a platform, obviously there need to be popular considerations that need to be built into all of those agreements and it has to be compliant with the legislation in that regard. 
for this to work, there has to be such credibility in that platform and that it can function and do what it should. And presumably also verification of data. So how do we audit the data? Um, and that also becomes that becomes very important from a buyer perspective. Um, will there be indemnications for errors that result in loss? And when we talk about technology risk, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is hacking risk. Will this be treated as force majeure or will some party actually bear that risk? Okay, so the token purchase agreement, which from my perspective is actually the most interesting. Um, so here you have the token being purchased and not kilowatt hours. So we are presuming that it has to be structured in a way um, that, the to that, the, that the token is actually only delivered once the customer receives the credit. And that's just our thinking in terms of how this actually can work. Um, also, it's important to understand whether this would be a standard form or negotiated structure. From a bankability perspective, and the market generally, I think, would, would welcome a standard form. Um, it's just to date under wheeling transactions that, of course, hasn't been achieved because you have differing um, off takers on the other side, different IPPs, different lenders. And although we are getting to basically a more standardized risk allocation, there are still aspects that are up for negotiation. Um, how the tariff will be formulated. So important to take into account that the token is actually of value is actually the webs per time of use. You're also potentially getting green attributes, and obviously you've got to take into account the buyer's margin as well. Vin also um, obviously raised a good point about the cost of this whole um, platform or data exchange um, agreement sitting on top of this also has to be fed in the, the tariff down the value chain. Um, what becomes very important, and it's not completely clear to me yet, and I, and I hope that we do dive into it in the questions, is the customer's ability to on-sell or reallocate as such um, those credits. And I say that more because um, if you read the notes, it's that basically that token, it has to be redeemed within the period that it's generated. So that's from the period that it's generated until the end of the billing month, um, it, it, until the end of the next billing month. Um, when payment is due to ESCOM or to the municipal distributor. So just wanting to understand if we see that as um, enough time and offering enough flexibility in terms of basically in a short space of time, getting rid of those tokens if the customer under the token purchase agreement ultimately has a very hard purchase obligation. Um, we see that customer force majeure and system events risks would be treated the same as traditional wheeling because um, the redemption of that token is still dependent on the customer actually consuming energy from the distributor um, or ESCOM. Very important in my mind is um, in terms of the Munich or ESCOM failing to actually then credit the account, who sits with that risk? And I think it's, I think if, if, if the Munich and ESCOM don't, it's the buyer. Okay, so um, the, these guarantor agreements, um, obviously there's one between ESCOM and the buyer, and then there's one between the buyer and the distributor, and these effectively replace the amendment to the ESAs that we're all used to in a, in a traditional wheeling framework. Um, and, 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 and this is the major point here, is that there needs to be a clear and determinal process, basically in terms of how that credit will be applied, what are the criteria in order for the credit to be applied. Um, and that's obviously with interface data from the platform. So the accuracy of that, receiving that on time, that always working as it should. But very importantly, consequences for ESCOM and the Munich if they fail to pass the credit. So will there be an indemnity for loss? We think just based on other agreements with ESCOM that that is unlikely. But then is something like a banking mechanism or a rollover of that credit possible? Uh, so just looking at practical ways to keep, keep the sector comfortable that the ultimate goal of receiving that credit is accomplished. Um, important that we've discussed a lot about Munich's and um, basically, you know, that we haven't been able to facilitate municipal wheeling at the level that we have on ESCOM. And I think as a part in thought, it's just that obviously the buying from municipalities on the contents of these agreements and how it would work without the agreement 
this th this isn't a concept that basically assists us, it assists the market. Um, so that's all from me. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alexandra. I, I think your legal insights have been extremely valuable. And I also hope that you will be making input into the initiatives that are being going to be undertaken to try and drive this through. Uh, your knowledge and insights and the legalities of the electricity industry, I think, are quite unique and uh, and badly needed uh, to drive this, this forward. Um, so thank you very much uh, for those. I'm sure Srovia was taking lots of notes. Uh, and Srovia, we'll get you this presentation uh, after the after the webinar, because I think there's a lot of uh, insights in this. So um, it's if you could please stop sharing your presentation, um, Alexandra. Uh, and I'm going to now introduce our last uh, presenter before we wrap up, and that is Anna Hajduka, uh, who is the founder and CEO of Africa Green Co. She's been a presenter on our webinars before, uh, or shall I say her company has been a presenter uh, on our webinars before, and she is also a qualified lawyer. She qualified in England, Wales, and the state of New York, and is an infrastructure and energy professional with more than 20 years experience in transactions, including project finance, PPPs, and project developments in emerging markets. Anna trained with Ellen and Overy. Ah, so you've got a good background there, <laughs> uh, Anna, and uh, worked for Fulbright and uh, Jaworski and uh, Trinity International. She specializes in African IPP project finance and PPA risk allocation within the energy sector, mainly in sub-Sahara Africa. She's negotiated renewable energy projects in the region and serves as an advisor for power pools. In March 2015, uh, the UNECE appointed Anna as a leader of 30 specialists uh, developing international renewable energy uh, public-private partnership standards for the Sustainable Energy um, for All Agenda, the Sustainable Energy for All Agenda. So, yeah, wow. Uh, thanks indeed also to you, Anna, for your participation. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, I see your camera is on and we can see you clearly and I'm sure we can hear you if your microphone is on. If you would like to share any uh, slides, please do so. Otherwise, no problem. Uh, you can just talk uh, around the subject as a response. Uh, over to you, Anna. So, ladies and gentlemen, my sincere apologies for um, the technical difficulties. I, I have been honored to be accommodated in the Danish embassy today for this important um, webinar as uh, they are one of the key founders of our business model. So I am actually speaking at the moment from um, the Danish embassy, thus the background that you see um, behind me. Um, so because I'm speaking from here, let me actually, uh, do this. Mm. So you can see my screen, Chris. Right, so I wanted to start with an introduction as to who we are. Um, my name is Anna Heidekar and I'm the CEO of Africa Green Co. And we are the first energy trader to join the Southern African Power Pool. We provide reliable and affordable renewable energy uh, services and long-term PPAs for new suppliers in the region, including South Africa. Uh, credit worthiness is an absolutely key issue. So we have very strong capitalization, especially through the shareholding of our investors, such as the Danish um, IFU, their investment arm, and Pitch Infoco Africa, so funding from the UK um, and um, other governments. We diversify risks through trading on a daily basis in the competitive markets of the Southern African power pool, and also through diversifying supply and demand requirements across the region. This helps to pool regional credit risk and risk of multiple buyers, therefore decreasing the costs and making the power more affordable. Currently, we are operational in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, and awaiting our license approvals in South Africa. Um, 
We have a significant generation pipeline that we're looking at at the moment, um, submitted via our procurement portal online of 7.5 gigawatts of new renewable energy capacity, 3.5 gigawatts of which is coming from South Africa alone. We've signed the first PPA in South Africa, and we are currently trading on the day ahead market of the Southern African power pool over three gigawatt hours of uh, monthly trades. We have a, a, a specialist trading team and energy uh, trading and risk management system, which underpins all our operational requirements, market analytics, liaisons with different market and system operators in the region, and allows for appropriate billing and other reconciliations. So we are in South Africa, and of course, I wanted to start with some of the points that were mentioned already earlier and then connected how it relates to the proposal to um, tokenize the virtual wheeling framework. Um, under the Electricity Regulation Act Amendment Bill, it is clear that uh, the electricity market of South Africa is moving towards a more competitive multi-structure one anticipating market transactions, physical bilateral transactions, and regulated transactions. ECT, I would also agree with the lady from Alan and Overy. And as you can see, a lawyer, once a lawyer, always a lawyer. So I start also with the legal and regulatory environment, even though the majority of my presentation will be from a trader's perspective. But we also would agree that ECT would constitute a market transaction. If we look, uh, I'm starting to paint this picture because it's very important for us to see where the market is going and therefore how to incorporate the virtual wheeling framework as proposed, which is a fantastic framework that might really de-risk the market and allow more consumers and suppliers to become active in the market. We see the new changes when it comes to the new roles of the TSO. And we also see a full list of licensable activities and whilst a NERSA li um, trading license might not be required for financial um, trading of ECTs, that also remains to be a question that I will soon tackle in a little bit more detail. These are just some additional relevant uh, definitions that I think we should keep in mind when it comes to anticipating what the market structure will be like and when it comes to who runs a market transaction, what it means, wh who runs a competitive trading platform, and who are the power market participants. Only those that participate through electricity physical trading or also those that participate as financial traders of the ECTs themselves. I also wanted to specify the last point there that the amendment bill seeks to ensure that there will be no discrimination between different generators or consumers or customers in relation to dispatching or balancing the system. And one of the key points from the perspective of a trader that we want to raise today is how the balancing dispatch and other more physical elements of wheeling, trading and supply of power uh, can form far apart or should do under the proposed tokenization of virtual wheeling. So as heard before, there is a number of benefits introduced by this pro proposal, mainly by removing the municipal and ESCOM payment risk and therefore de-risking the contractual commitment by the very customers. This should allow many more of them to participate, which is the objective, both from the municipal and ESCOM networks. Um, I think we've already heard quite a lot of description as to what benefit it gives as compared to a refund requirement from ESCOM under the original virtual willing proposal and uh, how it helps to facilitate the elimination of the credit risk as a consequence of no longer requiring that ESCOM uh, re cash refund. From the trader's perspective, I also wanted to add the following. We would fully agree with the paper that aggregators and traders will indeed play a crucial role in facilitating power supply to the commercial and industrial market by pooling that generation and offtake. We also would fully agree that we all need to move more to the provision of flexible power purchase agreements and terms. 
in order to not only mitigate investment risk, which in of itself is very important, but also very importantly, in order to facilitate the introduction of the very um, 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 structure as proposed by the new electricity bill when it comes to moving to a multi-market uh, model. So the, from the traders perspective, we would like to have a discussion in the next half an hour, more from the uh, presumption of is virtual wheeling truly only going to become a financial trading market? Because we see that there is an anticipated hourly national day head market under the structure to be introduced by the new legislation. So the question from our perspective is, how does the physical electricity trading sit next to the more financial electricity uh, wheeling as proposed by the new model? When it comes to the NERSA point on the licensing, as there is still a physical transaction that takes place between the buyer, in our case, Grinco, and the generator, that physical transaction will relate to specific supply from the IPP or generator and Greenco is a buyer, and most often they're not on a long-term basis. Basis. So because this is the inception of the transaction, we would perhaps still view that NERSA might want to license us, even though most of the trading or willing uh, financial accounting will go through the ECTs. I think the other point that we are um, grappling with and we would love to discuss with the other participants on the call is that how does the financial adjustment propose help the system operation activities of ESCOM or the different entities that will be introduced, such as, for example, balancing or other ancillary or operational matters. We believe it's very important to unpack those costs. As wheeling increases in South Africa, we need to, in our view as Greenco, move away from more simplistic monthly reconciliations into a more comprehensive compensation through a system operations agreement with the utility to help compensate for the costs that they are incurring, especially with the increase of third party intermittent wheeling on their network. So unpacking those costs from the perspective of the utility is very important because otherwise um, we might be imposing a disproportionate financial burden on the utility itself. When it comes to the bankability issues, most of them were raised and I'm not gonna repeat many of them. I just wanted to um, remind us of why we are here. Why is there the requirement for market opening? And what does that market opening for both financial and physical power trade entail as a benefit? Well, we are here because there is no longer the capability of the sovereign or national treasury of South Africa to back all the required new power generation coming on board. And that availability of fiscal space is not there in South Africa, and it's actually not there in most other countries in the region. So we can see here how the REIPP procurement increased and reached, or uh, by 2016, 13 billion US dollar, uh, dollars contingent liability on the national treasury of the, uh, of the South African government, meaning that since then, that has increased much more substantially. This is the latest data when it comes to ESCOM's impact on contingent liabilities on the national treasury. So these um, national treasury obligations are really quite extensive. So the view that is promulgated and underpinned by the new energy sector legislation, which moves us into more market-based models, will facilitate a move away from this contingent liability requirement. But that takes us to the point of uh, bankability questions that I would like to also add to some of the ones that Vincenzia raised um, as um, part of her presentation, which is how long can the ECT agreements um, um, be in duration 
taking into account that we will be actually only talking about municipalities which are currently in good standing and what happens when they fall back and are no longer in good standing in a couple of years time how will that affect the tradability of the tokens themselves in addition to that uh, also raising a question of the obligation of ESCOM to become the guarantor and to what degree will that impose a contingent liability on their and the National Treasury's website, uh, on website, uh, on National Treasury's, uh, uh, on the National Treasury itself. And if it does impose those liabilities, could we perhaps envisage an alternative third party guarantor of some of these obligations? We are speaking out loud here. We would like to discuss that in more detail, but it will be important point, I think, for us um, to discuss going forward. It, additionally, and here it is where some regulation might be required because the buyer itself, if it is a trader and aggregator, has to itself be sufficiently creditworthy. So they don't introduce a system risk as an intermediary in between. So that is something that we as Greenco have been very cognizant to make sure that we make the lending and other institutions comfortable when it comes to our credit worthiness, because the last thing we want to do is move to this new market opening and allow traders to be in place, which might in introduce a system risk. And then if the transaction fails, it takes all of us back by a few years and undermines the objectives that we are all trying to achieve. I think it would be also wonderful to hear from the team um, on how liquid do they believe the trading market for tokens can be and how long are they available for? When are they canceled out? How transferable are they? And what is their timeline? So some of the assumptions on the underlying market appetite for trading them and at what prices uh, from now or CPI indexed, et cetera, would be really fantastic to also discuss in order to have a more comprehensive picture. I think in conclusion, um, I also, also just wanted to raise a few legal considerations, but most of them were raised by Alexandra from Allen and Overy. But I think there is a legal considerations that we have to look at um, from two perspectives. One is if tokens are um, um, just a financial adjustment mechanism as a billing uh, through a billing method. And one is if we utilize distributed ledgers as that billing um, uh, system. If it is distributed ledgers, and if we are mo moving more into the electronic transferable records type of legislation, there's precedents out there that certain countries including Bahrain, Singapore, and now in the UK are already in the process of incorporating, which might really assist in the transferability of any tokens. So ladies and gentlemen, just to conclude, from a trader's perspective, we are excited about virtual wheeling. We believe that it will increase the supply and the demand for new generation. However, it is important and the main point that we want to leave you with today is how does the financial mechanism align with the actual physical trading of power and with the system costs that one has to compensate the utility for when it comes to that physical transfer, which will inevitably be happening. Because those system costs and unpacking of those tariffs for the system market operator and transmission system operator are, in our view, a key prerequisite for any wheeling, virtual or otherwise, to scale up in South Africa and anywhere else. And those costs have to be part and parcel of any conversation, especially if we are to be moving to more granular market in the future, which doesn't look at monthly reconciliations on a time of use basis, but actually go into an hourly basis and speak more granularly to what the consumer load profiles actually are. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Look forward to continuing this discussion and thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Anna. And uh, yeah, that was really interesting. A lot of insights there, a lot of experience that you've had in this world of trading. 
uh, you know, both in South Africa and in the regional environment and the South African power pool, Southern African power pool. Uh, so it was great to have you and Africa Green Co. as a participant and presenter today. And I think you added uh, a lot of important insights, uh, which is exactly what the purpose of this uh, webinar is uh, aimed at. We're going to go on then uh, with uh, At in the meantime. Um, At, over to you. But before I go over to you, let me, let me do the honors and introduce you, at least. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. Uh, so At Farah Merva is an energy utility specialist, and he's also the Secretary General of the South African IPP Association. Um, he's an, an energy utility specialist with more than 40 years experience in the South African electricity supply and distribution industries. He's managed electrical utilities for 25 years in Africa and has 15 years of energy management consultancy experience. He's a past president of the Association of Municipal Electricity Undertakings of Southern Africa, and he served as a board member of the Power Institute of East and Southern Africa, as well as the Engineering Council of South Africa. Excuse and he's me, a former member me, of... Yes, we can hear you. Uh, so let me just finish this intro with At. Absolutely. And then I suggest we go back to you, Anna. Uh, so let me just continue. So he was a former, uh, he served as a board member of Piazza and EXA. And he's a former member of the Apprentices Training Board for the local authorities and a founding member of the Electricity Supply Liaison Committee. And some of his le legacy projects, uh, contributions were the corporatization of the municipal distribution business in Mangaung. I, in the old days, I seem to remember you were the head of electricity at Bloemfontein Electricity, now Mangaung, and uh, you corporatized that uh, distributor to establish Centlac PTY Limited. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you're currently the Secretary General for SIEPA and the Director of the of, of, the, of Energy Transaction Services. So look, sort of a very brief summary. Uh, I, I know that's not going to be easy. Uh, and, and, and any particular insights that you may have on the subject before we then move to the poll, which I think is going to also add a lot of uh, value and uh, give us some idea on, on the way uh, the participants uh, and the attendees are thinking. So over to you, At. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good afternoon to all. Can I just check, can everyone hear and can you see the slide? 100%. Yes, Thank Ad. you very much. Quite a number of presenters talk about the change in the industry or the transformation. What have happened over a number of years and almost gave me some, some deja vu of the first transparency. I burned some 35 years back on competition in the industry on some of the proposals at that point in time. So every day we are still busy with, with transformation and change. And I think it is appropriate that perhaps we just take a quick look at where we stand in terms of the tools that we are busy looking at what through various Stain have unpacked in his proposal. Uh, over the years, there were quite a lot of development uh, in the market and, and in the industry. Um, and I just want to try and get to the get to the next slide. It is now gone. Let me just 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 try again. Yeah, there it is. Let me just just try again. Yeah, um, the picture uh, gives a little bit of a view of, of some of the, uh, of the history of reform in South Africa over quite a number of periods uh, over the last 35 years. And I do not want to dive into that, only to point out that under the first 20, 25 years, there was no private sector participation. Only with a reprogram here in the last parts, of, this, of a summary of a transformation in the industry, private sector participation came in. We're sitting now with the security of supply and Kruvier in his paper unpacked the problem and the challenges we have, and we're looking thus at tools, how we can improve the private sector participation and how we can get activities going to get more uh, power onto the grid. So what it's all about is to get private sector participation going and get more power on the grid. So we're trying to find ways and means how we can streamline all of the all of wheeling processes. The paper by Meridian actually started by, by looking at the traditional wheeling frameworks, also the virtual wheeling framework that is now in the process of being backed, also pointed out by, by Mondi, that ESCOM is in, is in support of, of not only the wheeling, uh, virtual wheeling, but, but also 
what we are looking at at this point in time, also the token wheeling tokens uh, we are Provia, uh, propose how to how to enhance this particular activity. So the traditional wheeling and how it works, well known. We've got several examples of it, but safe to say it stop uh, basically uh, almost at at the entry points within municipalities. Very few examples of that actually what is happening. So the four challenges that Provia in his paper is trying to uh, to solve is the fact that what we have on the table is more one-to-one -one at this point in time in South Africa. That's not really normal enough to facilitate uh, easy reallocation across many takeovers. Uh, quite a number of the speakers, and Alex have done so, uh, um, Vicentia from Standard Bank have, so, have done so, and Anna as well, pointing out uh, the challenges within the municipal networks. There's about only four municipalities at this point in time that does have some wheeling frameworks in place, uh, only limited wheeling in one or two of the municipalities and the best examples of Cape Town that is currently running a pilot, pilot project, mostly based on the traditional wheeling concepts of, of, of ESCOM, where, where the credits of this is, is credited into the bulk account. But still quite a challenge, what one needs to impact. So previous paper is focusing on this the legislative uh, challenges um, and the electricity supply agreements with the, with the amendments, both uh, Ellen and Overy, as well as uh, Anna from Greenco has also pointed out to, to that. So those four challenges is, is that what the paper is trying to, uh, to address. Now, uh, uh, Rubia and the number of uh, the presenters has already uh, dived into, into how the token system works. Do not want to uh, talk about that per se, only to point out that it seemed to me, if I read the document and look at the proposal, that that the distributors, that's in this case very much uh, the various municipalities that want to play in this area, also thinking about what's been proposed by ERA and the future industry to come and the changes in the market, that most probably this distributors here can also fulfill this kind of role setting directly buying from our IPPs. So this of course change the role and maybe the, the, the buyer or, or the trader uh, as been contemplated here in the sessions can assist the municipalities to get this particular activity also going. So what comes to the fore here is that this IPP doesn't only set in my opinion, on the bus bars of the ESCOM and pumping power into, into the ESCOM side. Uh, quite a number of the studies that I was personally involved in is actually for, for multiple IPPs setting not only on the ESCOM system, but both ESCOM and municipalities uh, pumping power or wheel power across from municipality into ESCOM customers and from municipality back from ESCOM back through the systems within within the municipality. So, Gruvia and perhaps uh, the listeners, when we when we unpack it, um, we need to think about that this IPPs will set also uh, in the municipal systems, not only on the municipal on on, on the ESCOM bus bars. So the WVWP, the virtual wheeling platforms, would have to also incorporate those activities within the municipalities. So, in summary, then, what I hear uh, uh, Meridian propose four main attributes of advantages that we managed to solve with a token, token system. It, it, it eliminates the payment risk because the payment risk moves now to the trader or the buyer away from the tra traditional approach. Uh, it reduces supplier offtake risk. We help tremendously with the licensing and the commercial activities. And Alan and Overy, Alex have pointed that out as well. Now we can work in time to come. Uh, something that can work very well is the hedging, uh, financial hedging uh, for customers that, that are ever exposed over the last many years now to ever increasing tariffs. And um, there's been a, a trouble for customers and large industries that there's no real price certainty and price predictability into the future. Green attributes, also, also a good one. Um, I think what we're getting right here is, is, is with this proposal of Meridian is that the municipalities remain neutral in their approach. 
uh, it's been ever ever an argument about what about the DOS cost within the municipalities that normally include also uh, the contribution to rates and taxes, whether one agree with it or not. It sits there as a cost within the system, and most certainly it helps ESCOM with some of the financial operational uh, uh, pressure. Mondi pointed out uh, that ESCOM is in support of going a step further from virtual wheeling into this. So, good proposal of this. What I specifically like is the is an idea about that uh, that all of the trading platforms, uh, the virtual wheeling platform, and the rest, and all the activities that will come in with us will really help and pave a way for the future power market. Uh, Anna pointed out in the very first slide that it's important to understand that if we look at the tools that is actually being developed here, and we see how the tools can help us, we need to remember that the tools is important to help us. Uh, to open the market, to get more power, power onto the grid. And we need to see it also in the light of a future market operator and how it will, how it will, how it will operate. So most definitely, I would, uh, I would like to hear from the, from, from the NTCSA in the discussions of how we think of that, that the guarantee role uh, from, from market operator probably can come in here and help. When I look at at wheeling, I normally test it against uh, six six sort of attributes, and I've used it in many in many jurisdictions in many places. And and those six uh, six areas sits on the left of the screen. Um, what about the firmness of a tran transaction? Can you can you get a firm agreement with us, or is it just merely a question of that you do a little bit of kilowatt hours reconciliation? The duration of this, uh, this works very well. Also, as, as Krupia pointed out, this can be not only longer term, but it can also be shorter term. So it works both ways. The delivery point is, is not an issue anymore because the delivery point can be anywhere, either on the municipal network where the IPP may sit, anywhere on the ESCOM network. And the, and the value of that wheeling is translated into, into the token. Size of a tra transaction normally goes in. Yes, it is captured within the TPA, the token purchase agreement between the trader or the buyer, trader most 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 probably or the aggregator uh, that then would would need to firm up the transaction quantum uh, between him and the various uh, uh, off takers or, or consumers. The proposal here. The way I understand it is that uh, we're not going to balance back to the typical load profile of, uh, of a customer, as is in the case with the normal traditional wheeling as well as with the virtual wheeling con concepts. Um, uh, I think we need to think about it a little bit more, and I would also like to hear your opinion of others about it. Losses, yes, it also ticks the boxes of that. Uh, losses on the webs, uh, well defined, it's well documented, it's well available. We all know what it is. There's good documentation on the table, so it can easily be brought into the equation. If an IPP sits within the municipal network, yes, we would need to think a little bit about that more. Uh, most probably, those those losses would be would be calculated in terms of load flow studies or as per the cost of supply that, that few municipalities have, have actually picked up. So. I'm, I'm, I'm summarizing then with a few questions and thought forward. Uh, the elephant in the room about the load shedding, how do we deal with it? Uh, surely the buyer cannot sell more ETCs in terms of his TPA uh, than, than what the customer off-taker in terms of the time of use takes. Uh, the virtual platforms, how far have we developed them? Uh, Force from the traders and the banks perhaps in terms of that. Um, uh, from the future, from the structure of a, of a proposal, it seems that the municipal as a distributor can also take place uh, in, in that role. I would like to hear what the municipality says about that. If we go on, uh, as, the, as the IPP can also sit in the municipal network. And then, and then in conclusion, um, the idea is that this ECT are completely tradable between all customers and participating distributors. Um, Will this be accepted by the municipalities, all of them, in terms of the MFMA? Can it tick the boxes in the, in the MFMA? Um, if the municipality need to be the guarantor where the IPP says there, 
we all know, as Anna pointed out, that 65 billion is in the rears to ESCOM and two thirds of 167 licensed municipalities have a sustain sustainability challenge. We would need to talk to NERSA about the licensing and specifically the value of the ECT and get NERSA's buy-in in terms of that. Um, then, uh, then municipalities, although we doesn't have to have the same uh, uh, deals, charges and cost of supply work out, they would have to have some wheeling activities going. So last, then just two, two thoughts uh, and, and, and then I'm going to hand back to Chris. Uh, in my opinion, the off-taker will only uh, enter into a, into a TPA where, is there, where, is there, where there is a differential between the bundled municipal tariff. Uh, I'm talking about the power part, the fix in the capacity and the energy, and the WEPS non-local authority, uh, as, as you would still have to pay the deals and the losses and the profits in quite a number of studies. That was always uh, the bone of contention that one needs to look at. And the trader on the other line will only jump into the transaction if he can put the off-taker that he got a business deal. So Chris, with these few thoughts and these few, few questions, I'm handing back to you. And I'm looking forward to a nice, solid, strong set of discussions in time to come. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, At. Uh, if I could ask you to stop sharing your presentation. Uh, you've given us a good summary and a lot to think about uh, based on your own experience. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of work ahead. I, I'm just conscious that we're about running about 20 minutes late at the moment. And uh, so I'm not sure that we're going to have that much time for discussion. But on my side, I'm happy to go on longer, uh, you know, if others are. But I am conscious of the need that people need to um, uh, rush off. Uh, you know, time is tight and there's a lot of uh, people that have got a lot of things on their plate. But before you go, anybody, please don't go anywhere until you've at least completed this, uh, this poll. Uh, and I'm going to put up on the screen, and I hope this all works, uh, and I'm going to launch a poll. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, I hope you can see what I'm seeing. And that is a poll uh, here uh, with three questions. Uh, and in each of these questions, you can select some answers. So uh, the first question that I'd like you to consider is, uh, how do you rate this token wheeling as a potential solution to accelerate the rollout and purchase of private power in South Africa? And the answers is, is really either excellent, good, fair, poor, or terrible. Uh, and I'd really like to uh, ask you to uh, indicate um, uh, by means of the uh, radio button selection as to which you think it are. This is, uh, uh, you know, you have to choose one out of these five um, uh, options. Excellent, good, fair, poor, or terrible. I see the votes are coming in, uh, and there is quite a good level of participation. Uh, and you can see it online, uh, you know, the results of that first question. But moving to the second question, once you've answered the first question, is this. We've heard today that there is going to be a need for some real heavy lifting, uh, not by ESCOM, not by municipalities, uh, but by the private sector, if this thing is going to happen. Uh, you may not agree with that entirely, uh, but uh, certainly Hrivia's view is that uh, it is going to take heavy lifting by the private sector. And the question is, would you or your organization be interested in participating in a stakeholder-led and resourced process to assist the implementation of token wheeling? Again, this is a single choice. You can choose one of three options. Yes, you would be interested in participating. Maybe you'd be interesting in, interested in participating. And no, you would not be interested in participating. And I see the votes coming in thick and fast uh, there, uh, giving a good indication that this poll seems to be working. Uh, it's a live poll. You can see the results uh, online as I can. And then, of course, the last uh, question, question number three, is just to find out a little bit about who you are as an organization. Uh, so the question is, if token wheeling is implemented, how would you like to participate? It's a multiple choice, so you can participate you know, as uh, in, in, in different capacities. 
Uh, so would you be interested in, would you be participating as a buyer or trader? Uh, would you be participating as a customer or off taker? I hope you understand these terms from the presentations you've had. There's a question of being a buyer or a trader. Uh, there's an off taker or a customer. Uh, there is the generator, which is generally an IPP, an independent power producer. Uh, or you could be participating as an electricity distributor. Now, remember, municipalities are the major electricity distributors, as are uh, as is Eskom distribution uh, is an electricity distributor. So we'd be interested to know: Are you? Would you be participating as an electricity distributor, or would you be participating as a project funder? You know, a financial institution, bank uh, of some kind, or other uh, financial institution. Uh, you know, because we've heard that this um, token wheeling, uh, you know, also assists, uh, you, you know, the, the financiers. Are you a financier? Is that how you would be participating? Or lastly, would you be participating as a technology provider? This could be a software provider, developing of platforms, trading platforms, uh, and or a blockchain system. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of technologies. So now you could be more than one. So this is a multiple choice question. You can tick uh, uh, more than one. So uh, I'm going to give it uh, just a minute or two longer. Please, you don't have to agonize about the answers. Uh, you just give a quick gut feel uh, and, and, and give us your response. Uh, don't think about it too hard. Um, and, uh, and and uh, we're going to analyze this uh, in more detail after the webinar. You will also have the results shared with you in the report that we're going to produce after this webinar so that everybody who registered to attend this webinar uh, will get the report. It will have the links to the video recording. It will have uh, links to download all the presentations, uh, and it will have the output of this poll that is underway. So. Look, we've got quite a lot of uh, responses here. I'm just looking at about 320 responses. I see there's still uh, you know, a lower set of responses for question number three. So presuming that people are still busy on, on question number three, but please, everybody, uh, if you could respond uh, as much as you can, um, because this is going to be very important in taking this whole thing forward. Okay, I'm going to leave this uh, poll uh, running. Uh, while I introduce our next um, uh, moderator, uh, who's going to moderate uh, the um, uh, the panel discussion, uh, as I say, we're running a bit late. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, can I please introduce to you uh, Bukelwa Nzamandi? She's from the Power Futures Lab at the UCT Graduate School of Business. Uh, she has a, she is a PhD candidate uh, in the Power Futures Lab. And her research focuses on distributed energy resources and power sector transitions with a focus on the democratization of South Africa's electricity systems. Bukelwa has nine years of experience, over nine years of experience as a climate and energy professional involved in research, capacity building and communication, project management and policy development processes in South Africa, Kenya and India, She's also uh, a social and intersectional justice advocate and has contributed to and led related projects within civil society organizations. She's committed to the pursuit of inclusive and progressive work, presenting contextual and intersectional solutions to developmental challenges in, southern, in society. I think you can see from this presentation uh, or the, all the presentations today, it's also a, it's about this democratization of electricity and bringing new capacity in the, in the, into the grid as fast as possible in a distributed way. So if you look at, at Bukawa's interests and background, I think she's eminently suited to uh, moderate uh, this uh, Q&A. It's not an easy task. She's not able to go through each and every question. So I've asked her to try and identify some common themes in the questions and, and to pose these uh, to uh, the panel, and if I can ask, please, all the panelists to please switch on your uh, your uh, video cameras, so we know who's out, which of you are present. Uh, and I'm going to now end the poll first of all. Okay, I've ended the poll. I'm um, going to now uh, ask um, Bukelwa to uh, to put to our panelists so one by one. Uh, various themes that she's seen coming out of the questions. And if we've got enough time, 
and I am happy to stay on. We'll also handle a few of the questions posed by people putting up their hands. So, okay, um, everything uh, looks good. And I'm going to now hand over to you, Bukelwe, uh, to, uh, to put your questions to the panelists uh, as you see fit. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to our panelists as well for just uh, an insightful, a um, lot of questions that were coming through, which some I feel uh, fell because we I, I have a view of the questions from um, the participants. Um, but also, Chris, I think I would suggest much earlier for us to get to the hands, uh, because I see that some of the questions have been answered and the ones that are actually left open have either been answered in part or not completely. But I think just to kick us, well, whilst people think about their questions, maybe, Javier, you can chat a little bit more about there's the theme of like tokens and just understanding um, the data that is coded in the tokens, um, how they valued and that value system. I think that came across quite strongly in a lot of the um, more than five of the questions. And then, of course, um, some of the panelists who spoke specifically to the legislative and legal and legal processes and some of the thoughts around there. Um, there is some contribution that then can follow after Dr. Javier Stein's um, contribution. And then I think after that, probably take two questions around that and then we can take hands, if that's okay, just so that we have the people that are online also ask their questions. Okay, um, over to you, Javier. Uh, Bakelba, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're out of time, so I'll be I'll try and be very brief. Uh, but can I quickly, while I've got the floor, just say two things. Firstly, I just wanted to acknowledge that, of course, uh, yeah, this work is not uh, its not the work of one person, it's the work of a team, and I just want to acknowledge the work of uh, our co-authors, Liesl, Celeste, and Monwabu. Their names are on the front page of the, of the report. Uh, secondly, uh, I am, uh, to use a, a colloquial term, I'm blown away by the quality of the input by the panelists, and I really want to thank you all, every single one of you, for the thought you've given to the issues and uh, your critical engagement, therefore, I think that's really uh, encouraging and, and uh, stimulating. If you work on something, it's really nice to have people in, engage with it and respond, and it's in, encouraging, perhaps, for, we, for where we could, could take this. Um, uh, if I may, Bakel, I might quickly respond to one or two key questions uh, in addition to the ones that you've asked, because I think it will help. It will help members. Uh, the, the colleagues. The one is the question that Anna was asking about the, the difference between physical trading and how it sits alongside electricity, uh, fun financial trading of uh, ele electricity. It's an important question. It's quite a technical issue um, and something which we also grappled with. And I think the, we've learned a bit more since we published the report. Of course, we are, you know, you keep on thinking and talking to people about the issues. I mean, I think the best, very brief, short answer that was given to me, uh, and I can't uh, speak on his behalf, but I had some useful conversations with ESCOM colleagues, Keith Bowen in particular. And my understanding is that really there's a distinction uh, between what you do with token wheeling and the uh, essentially the balance uh, obligation that will be placed on the generators. So in a sense, the balance obligation uh, uh, commitment or responsibility will be between the generator and the system operator. And, uh, and and they will have to uh, make their for, uh, generation forecasts. And then in real time, of course, they'll be under or over and they'll have to find ways of solving that problem by, uh, by buying you know, on the actual power market that we're talking about here that will be set up in our, uh, uh, with our legislative reforms. But the tokens will be generated on the renewable energy actually inserted in, uh, in injected into the grid. So th we can come back to that at some later point, but that's the, that's the key, key distinction here. There's, a, there's another, uh, Bakelba, there's another point in that uh, that has, I think, got people quite uh, concerned, and that's the idea of the guarantor, right? And I think perhaps, I'm not sure whether we our, our choice of um, uh, uh, term was the, perhaps the best one there. The, in this particular, we don't mean a, a, a guarantee, like a government guarantee or anything like that, right? What we mean in this context is the tokens are, in essence, um, issued on behalf of the party who's, uh, on whose grid the power is injected. And, and, and so what you're really saying is, uh, in that guarantor ag agreement, the essence of it is a commitment by the, uh, the guarantor, and let's assume it's ESCOM, uh, who receives the power onto its grid and who has more power to sell, of course, to its customers, a commitment to honor the voucher or the token or voucher in inverted commas when it's presented to it by the final customer. So it's simply that. It's simply the commitment to implement a credit 
for the power that was injected into your grid. And of course, that's the same idea as you had with conventional reading. It's it's uh, it's nothing it's nothing different. Um, yes, art, one can implement this in municipal areas. We have definitely given this a lot of thought. And the idea to, for instance, generate tokens from a rooftop solar in a better generation is a great example of that. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, tying it up to the prepayment system is a very powerful idea, which could be quite rapidly uh, unlocked. Uh, the, uh, uh, but the issue around the data in the tokens um, uh, it, it essentially, uh, and maybe a bit more broader about the data and concerns about who controls it and et, 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 uh, et cetera. I mean, I think this is where the technical planning will have to be done very carefully. Uh, I think the idea is that we literally must record uh, all the relevant data about the power being generated. And it must be uh, an immutable record of that particular kilowatt hour. It must, you know, and there's a long list of things that you have to record. I've put some of them in the, in the report and in the presentation. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but that must be the basis on which everything else happens. Whether it's the valuation of the power because you've got time there, whether it's the greenness uh, and, and it's essentially uh, acknowledging the green attributes and whether you need separate recs or whether this, uh, it, it, those are all technical details, but the information will be captured. And then the further point about the data and more broadly about the, um, uh, the, the virtual reading platform or the data management system. This is uh, personally not something we, we, you know, we haven't gone into this in a lot of detail, but I want to put on the table a key principle here is we really do need to avoid a dependence on a single point of failure. We need to, in this day and age, it's possible to design technological solutions where you can have multiple uh, uh, versions or your copies, uh, not versions, copies of the data where you can have more than one virtual reading platform where the tokens are transferable and tradable between them, where if one of them fails, the system can still keep, keep functioning. So this is not a centrally planned all eggs in one basket solution. And yes, distributed ledgers is one way in which one can implement that, but there are other ways of doing it. Uh, the, it's more the principle that's important than the details we can we can debate. Um, I think I have uh, I haven't discussed the value thing, but perhaps I should stop there. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Fulvia. And then there's there are questions also that were around just the dependency on a highly regulated space, um, or dependency on um, rather dysfunctional system. I think there there's a lot of red tape that currently exists, and there were some. Um, issues that were raised by the different speakers, whether it be from a regulatory standpoint or from a legal standpoint. So if we're looking at timelines, I think that's one of the other questions that came up, um, especially the, the panelists who spoke about just some of the gaps that exist and some of the things that would need to be looked at. What are some of the easy levers just like to make sure that this moves ahead um, to a certain extent over and above just broader stakeholder engagement? What are some of those um, small steps that we can make in the interim to ensure that this actually uh, helps a system that is changing quite rapidly. Um, and these, this question maybe might be to uh, uh, Vincenzia and Alexandra. I think I'll start with you two. Great, thanks. And I think, you know, as mentioned, it is key to unlock this. Um, it's specifically for aggregators and traders looking to sell power to, to many off takers and the nimbleness that's required. So key is definitely, you know, time is definitely of an essence here. I think it would be to, ex be to explore some of the points that have been raised in terms of considerations and see if those are easily addressed. And then, you know, potentially roll out a pilot um, study of this proof of concept in one of the municipalities that are already quite far advanced in terms of looking at wheeling frameworks. So a suggestion from my side. Thanks, I completely agree with um, everything that Vincenzi has just raised. Um, for me though, I think the starting point is that drive from the private sector through NECOM for proper stakeholder engagement so that all parties are aligned, um, especially the municipalities. Sure. And I mean, along the lines of that question, if the other three panelists also have something to contribute, please do. Uh, if not, otherwise, I think it's a good time to move to um, hands and people who can just voice their questions to the panelists. 
Kela, yes, uh, I think I think hundred percent spot on. We need to try and get this embedded within the NECOM processes and so forth because this is a splendid idea that we that we should take forward. So first, there, uh, I think we also need to do work with a with a NERSA so that NERSA can help us tick the necessary boxes so that we don't get some obstacle at that point in time. I would also like to hear from the municipalities, maybe specifically the EMU what they can do to uh, get the members together so that they can also collectively think about it. I had an idea of, of perhaps years back, what one have done was to get national bylaws in place. Having getting national bylaws in place for possible adoption by the various municipalities will streamline the process for quite a number of municipalities that may struggle to get it in place. So if you can work on national bylaws, add that in, and part of a process, it could quickly solve a lot of the things that municipalities would take a long time to. Okay, we seem to have lost the sound uh, from us. I hope you can hear me. Uh, at, can you try speaking? Okay, we seem to have uh, lost at uh, there, but uh, Bukelwa. Um, is, is there any other questions you'd like to uh, uh, to direct to any of the panelists before we look at the people okay. who want to ask que questions by hand? There were a few yeah. questions for Monday. Sorry, I was um, muted there. So yeah, I Monday, over to you. Um, Please. I think the, the, sorry, Monday. Sorry, the first question for you was. From ESCOM's perspective, realistically, what are the timelines foreseen for the com commercial implementation of a virtual wheeling concept as presented here today? And I, I guess this takes into consideration the fact that ESCOM already has a proposed virtual wheeling concept um, in place. Yeah, well, no, thanks for the question. Yeah, I think uh, the, our response is uh, on the basis of what you've just been through, what you're currently going through with the Vodacom uh, a pilot project, uh, as I've indicated, uh, that project uh, from concept uh, to uh, the point whereby we're going to have a, a, a pilot, I mean, a platform that uh, we are going to run that took us uh, not less than two years. Uh, so, and uh, those are sort of the time frames that, uh, uh, that, that, that we, we have in mind in regard to the governance that comes with it. And also the various stakeholders that must come in, uh, that, that must uh, be a part of this. So it's going to be slightly broader sort of set of stakeholders. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, through the NICO process, if we manage to get it there, uh, we should be able to 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 maybe truncate some of the timelines. Thanks. Thanks, Monde. The other one was uh, re responded to during our. The discussion that that were happening, and then there's a, a question around green attributes, um, and I think this one will go to Kruvia specifically, uh, which is the green attributes of the energy produced in the tokens accounted for financially, and who benefits from that? Uh, is it the municipalities? Oh, sorry, do municipalities pay more uh, green premium that the IPP benefits from, or less? Um, so really a question around like some of the green attributes. Um, there's also a question around like double counting here. Um, who's responsible for the costs associated with administration? Um, similarly, who is liable in the event that um, the REC cannot be delivered? Um, and again, some of these questions were responded to in the in the conversation, but just to provide a bit more clarity in case there are some residual questions around that. Uh, thanks, Bakalwa. Um, I think the first point to make is that the the question of the green attributes of the power is essentially the same, uh, irrespective of the model of wheeling you're using, right? There's an IPP injecting power into the grid and somebody's going to claim the green attributes and you need to provide for that con contractually. So the lawyers are, are really the better parties to, to respond to this question. Um, there are options, and I think, uh, and sorry, the question about double counting as well of green attributes is is a question about the nature of the RECs and how a REC system works, which is beyond the scope of this particular conversation. Um, I, I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. Some, some other way, it's just something that you have to make sure it doesn't uh, is not you know solved. Um, 
the uh, but there's no reason why uh, one can you know you can decide how you want to set up the token system and essentially uh, you can even have it in such a way that um, people can choose along the value chain as they sell and buy tokens, whether they're buying it with a green attribute or whether the green attribute is split off and sold off to, to somebody else and whether, whether, whether there's a rec that's associated with the token or whether the integrity of the token itself is enough to enforce the, the claim for green attributes. Those are technical questions that have to be resolved, but it essentially creates a, a really nice op op opportunity. The cost uh, is again the same question it, it applies to all the wheeling models it's not unique to, to this model um, it's essentially the cost of ensuring the integrity of the metadata and what you know about the plant uh, and then the uh, essentially the cost of if you want to run a separate rec system uh, that would be uh, involved as well so. sure thanks Kabir I think now is a good time just considering time to move over to our participants that are online so if there are questions that can come from you, please just do so by raising your hands and we'll take them um, through Chris. Ah, thanks, uh, Bukalwa. And yes, I can see at the moment two hands are up. And if there are any more that want to put up a hand, please do so. We'll try and get to them. Uh, but the first one is from uh, Clyde Mallinson. Uh, Clyde, uh, I've allowed you to speak and you can switch on your mic. Please go ahead with your question. Thanks very much. I'm a I'm a private customer in a unit in a municipality of good standing. The municipality can actually be the buyer of the electricity from the IPP and will then on sell it to me. And I wish now I was in a municipality of bad standing because the municipality is going to want to not just be the same in the same position it was. It's going to want to take advantage or could take advantage of making the cost saving which I would then hope it would plow into distribution grid upgrades and perhaps cross subsidization, uh, increasing cross subsidy to, to indigent households. But I'm just pos positioning myself, who gets to say whether the municipality can gobble it all up if they're able to, or whether it can still allow uh, filter through uh, via traders to particular customers. Uh, I should be actually asking a, uh, a customer within a municipality or a municipality, but if you get the drift of the question, I would like a response. Thanks. Uh, Bukelwe, if you could direct that to uh, <laughs> one of the uh, esteemed panelists uh, who, or one of the panelists, if you want to deal with it, just put up your hand or wave your hand and, and, and deal with it. <laughs> yeah, if we have I a panelist, can you do yeah. that? Okay, well, let me try and take a kick at that one. Um, Clyde, I think you are 100% right. There is a danger in that if that municipality is of no good standing. And from the current statistics, we know that two thirds of the municipalities does have, su have sustainable problems. So, and they own ESCOM 65, 65 billion. So it is definitely a risk. I would think that in practice, what will happen, the IPP will simply not enter into agreement with that municipality because the municipality is not a good standing. So you will also find with the market, up upcoming market, my, my, my opinion is that although there's a number of municipalities that may want to play in the market, they will not be of financial good standing to be able to play in the market. They will not put the credit forward. And, and they will not be able to be find financial uh, viable to actually do so. So I would think that um, that such municipalities will will not get that agreement between them, that PPA agreement between them and the IPP going simply simply because um, it will not be a bankable long term financial uh, transaction. Do not think that the IPP will stick out his head uh, in those in those kind of circumstances. It will it will just not. It, it, it will not. It will just not work. Um, there, there may be some 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 nice opportunities where I think the traders and some of the aggregators that that's there, they could probably step in and, and provide some of those services on behalf of the municipalities, because in some of the studies I was involved in, there's a number of municipalities that is viable, but doesn't have a capacity and, and and that would want to play, but they cannot play because of capacity. And this is where I would think. The traders can come in and lend a hand and solve that particular thing to get for those municipalities on good standing uh, systems and, and processes going. 
Okay. Uh, Bukel, uh, I see another hand that is up, uh, and that is Matthew Cruz. Uh, Matthew, can I ask you to ask your question? And if you could direct it to one of the panelists so that we know who you would like to think is the best person to deal with it. Otherwise, any of the other panelists can also step in if they want to. Uh, I, I please switch on your mic and over to you, uh, Matthew. Now, I see that Matthew seems to have disappeared. Now, I'm not sure whether he's offline or not. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he doesn't appear to be there. So let's go on to the next hands up. And that is um, Michelle uh, Rivarola, if I've got the right. Uh, Michelle, would you like to speak? And I see Matthew's hand is up again. So we'll get to you, Matthew. Michelle, are you there? Phew. I see he's now disappeared. Okay, we're going to you now, Matthew. I'm allowing you to talk. Please switch on your mic, Matthew. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. I appreciate it. And thank you, panelists, for your inputs. Uh, Chris, in, in your presence, I'd refer to myself as, as a junior energy expert, and I'm looking forward to future collaboration with you. Um, but yeah, let me direct my question to, to at. Um, it, it's regarding, as an as a, um, as a energy producer and consumer, is it possible to get a loan of sorts uh, with this with the ECTs where I can go into credit and debit? And how would that, who would be the um, controlling body that would that would coordinate that? Or is it at the end of every month, I must, I must settle my account uh, and not be at real time? That's the first question. And then just when when can I expect to be able to, to trade these ECTs? Uh, happy for the panelists also take them. Yeah. My understanding is the way Rubia defined it in his in his paper is is that one will try and define those EF, EFTs to be to be available and valid for a particular period, so you don't leave them open at infinitum. It will and and I think there's good reason for for that because the value of the EFT have been created at a particular point in time, either against the avoided ESCOM cost at that point in time or the balancing cost that may set in the future market to come, or the cost that the municipality see at that point in time if, if the municipality then um, issue issue then then than that. So it shouldn't be open at infinito and one should try and define it within, uh, within particular periods. Whether it's only for a day or whether it can be a bit longer, uh, uh, probably it can, go, it can go into a month or so on within the same kind of periods. Uh, we all know that the value of a weighted cost different, is, is different depending on when it occurs. So probably one cannot take it too much out of the season and so forth. But uh, I would think that if one can define it within particular periods and so forth, um, it, will, it will work fine and, and you'll be able to trade those, uh, those, those tokens, but you have, uh, have to have a limited period in a definite time. Perhaps I can add on a question to that, if I may. Please. For Dr. Stein and, 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 and the team, um, if they're available for a particular period of time, per, um, and taking into account they might be used as renewable energy certificates as well. Perhaps two tokens could be issued. One for the certification of the renewable energy cert certificates, which should be of much longer duration, and one for the actual kill of an hour represented as traded to avoid any payment risks. And therefore you have a tradable two tokens, but the market and the availability of duration for such trading will be different as between the two. And if you align the token for renewable energy certification with the relevant international standards, that could really be um, a very significant way of how to monetize and bring significant new value to um, when bringing new renewable energy generation in the market. So perhaps because of this availability point and duration point, which is different between one and the other, um, two tokens might be a good idea to consider. I see another hand up, uh, uh, Gugu Shozi. I'm going to allow you to talk now, uh, uh, Gugu, uh, and if you could switch on your mic and ask your question. Thank you. Google, your microphone is still off. Uh, can you please switch it on and ask your question? 
Okay, Google seems to be having a problem there. Let's move to the next uh, presenter and I'm going to allow Conrad Schmidt to talk. Uh, Conrad, uh, please uh, switch on your microphone and, uh, and speak. Please speak up, it's very quiet. Okay, can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Yes, but speak as loud as you can, please. Okay, let me see if I can make this louder. Or can you hear me now? We can hear you, but very faintly, but ask your question, please. Okay, okay. Um, our company has four sites, and one of the sites we generate solar power that we would like to reel to the other sites. Two of them, however, are connected to ESCO substations that are located in these substations. That makes reading useless and our whole conversation today doesn't help. Now, the total, the total amount of energy we produce far exceeds our own consumption and we can easily contribute it for uh, by adding more energy to the grid. However, we need to get rid of the load shedding of certain substations. When will that happen? Because load shedding as a technology method is, is extremely damaging to ESCO and to users. When can that be? How can that be brought to an end? I hope uh, you've heard the question. I had great difficulty in understanding or in hearing the question. Has anybody uh, was able to answer this, please? Um, Chris, I think Conrad's um, question is linked to the one that he put um, on the chat, which was around just like the damaging how damaging um, load shedding is for equipment and that somehow limits to an extent what they can do as a company. Conrad, if I summarize that incorrectly, please also just um, add what I missed out. But yeah, it was very difficult to hear you. Is anybody that heard the question would like to yeah. answer? Yeah, I was asking Edgar, please. Yeah. Uh, Mondi, did you hear the question? Otherwise, we're going to move on. I'm sorry, Chris, I did not hear the question. I was trying to make out what Conrad was saying. But uh, yeah. you can just put it in the chat. We'll pick it up. I, I had the same problem. I couldn't hear the question properly uh, for some technical reason. Uh, let's now move on to Michelle uh, Rivarola. I've allowed you to talk. Michelle, please switch on your microphone. Ask your question. Hi. Um just one concern and one question. Well, the concern is I see this pulling in the opposite direction to RP22023 of government. Um, and that's a concern because particularly now the minister is talking about nuclear power and so on, which will end up probably being a stranded asset um, if this token system does actually take foot. But the question relates to to warehousing or storage. A lot of the problems experienced overseas with wheeling power is that the traders have no obligation, no commitment at all to either the grid or uh, the generators other than buying power or to the consumers other than providing power. Um, is there no merit in actually saying, well, you want to trade power, take 10% of your turnover or take 10% of your profit and you must invest that into some sort of a warehousing or a storage measure, be it a hydro hydroelectrics um, pump storage scheme, be it batteries, whatever. But you need to actually participate and not just take out of the whole system because a trader doesn't actually play any active role, doesn't have any risk at all. The risks are with the generators, with the transmitters, and with the distributors. Hannah, I think you could answer this perhaps if you would like to give it a crack. What do you think? Well, I would disagree that the, the role of the trader is only one that actually trades electricity. It depends, that's a kind of short term view of a trader that enters the market to just arbitrage um, um, the opportunities that are there um, at, at any particular time. We see trading and aggregation more important from the perspective of actually replacing ourselves as the buyer and therefore providing very long-term price certainty 
um, and tenors of PPAs to the new generators. So we are linking um, uh, effectively um, the, you, you know, we, we are taking significant financial liabilities on our balance sheet. In addition, we're taking risks. We do not believe that consumers in South Africa, but for very few, very large intensive users are willing to match or back to back the new IPP long-term PPA tenors with the supply agreement tenors. And we are therefore taking a risk whereby we buy on a 20 to 25 year basis, but we sell to consumers on a three, five, 10, 15 year basis. We are relying on the diversified nature of that consumer uh, demand in order to diversify that risk away from ourselves, but still it's a significant risk that we are taking. And the only reason why we are able to take that risk is because in our case, we are diversifying it, it not only across the demand in South Africa alone, but across the demand in the entire region as members of the Southern African Power Pool. So we think that we actually take significant risks. Short-term trading that is just the arbitrage in the market is not what I believe we are proposing here or not what will commit or contribute to the development of this sector. So really, it is a question of how do we define traders? There has been a proliferation of names for them, whether brokers, whether traders, whether aggregators. The question is not in the name. The question is in the service provided. Are they willing to give their balance sheet on a long-term basis to new suppliers? And are they on the back end sufficiently diversifying their risk or our risks in this case across a portfolio of buyers and across a tradable power pool, which is why for us as a trader that this, the, this that comparison and alignment between a financial trading market and a physical trading market is key because we are happy to financially mitigate risk. But if we underlyingly do not mitigate it operationally by moving those electrons around, we might actually have an additional systemic risk at hand. So I would just, you know, re-clarify as to how that definition of a trader is by looking at what the service and what the liability and what the duration of those agreements that traders are offering in the market really uh, uh, amount to and how um, mm -hmm. therefore beneficial they are for the entire system stability. Thank you. Yes, yes. Ruby, I wonder if you can just tackle the question of uh, you know, the alignment of the IRP uh, with the proposals that you're making and the wheeling and trading of electricity. Are these things aligned or misaligned? Can they coexist or are they mutually exclusive? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Just on that previous question about training, I just want to endorse uh, Anna's answer. One shouldn't confuse the question of uh, you know uh, short-term speculation in financial markets with highly complex derivative products, which is called trading. With what we're talking about here these are completely different things and this is what we're talking about here is actually unlocking access to customers and investors to shift the risk to where it should be so that people can make appropriate investment decisions uh, so that's an important point on the irp I, i'm not sure uh, really what the question is to be honest with you chris um we uh, it's it's a long consistent part of our government's policy that we need to accelerate the rollout of renewables it's a consistent uh, policy that we need to accelerate private sector investment. Um, uh, and I think, uh, including the RP 2023 uh, and draft draft document. And uh, I think this is really, and also I refer to the energy action plan, the Newcom energy action plan, which uh, now also relies significantly on private power and wheeling. And this is really just a specific uh, proposal for how we could help un unlock those uh, pre-existing policies. Thanks. Uh, look, I, I see there's only two more hands ups, and I think we're going to have to call it a day then um, because people have to uh, got other commitments. But Veli Pariachi, um, I see your, your hand is up. I'm going to allow you to talk. Please switch on your mic. Veli is, uh, you know, the strategic advisor of the AMEU, and, and I think his voice needs to be heard. Uh, Veli, over to you. Thanks, Chris, and, uh, and thanks to the panelists. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, I'll be very quick, Chris. Uh, uh, 
thanks for the uh, excellent presentation. The the just two comments. Uh, just from experience, I think if I'm NASA and, and coming from a substance over form, substance over form, uh, NASA is probably going to view whether it is kilowatt hour or token. Uh, they're probably going to view the token or the money aspect as the kilowatt hour. And so I'm of the opinion that uh, they're going to regulate it. That's one aspect. And the second aspect to that is that uh, they will regulate it to protect the, the end use customer. So that's just my view. But the second point that I wanted to really raise, you know, uh, these IPPs, traders, the commercial people uh, are business people. So there's no free lunch. So, uh, and we had a lot about risk being talked about, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. So the, the utility, utilities, meaning ESCOM and the Munich will be, and I use the word very advisedly, forced to carry these transactions on their balance sheet. Now, I'm saying this, this is where Treasury will come in, uh, uh, and they'll have an issue with this in the sense that both ESCOM and the municipalities are financially naked, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm leading to is that maybe Crove and the team, if, if this transaction can be made off balance sheet, in other words, by some innovative means, if this transaction can be made, uh, can be done out of balance sheet, uh, I can tell you now, I think it'll fly with Munich and um, and ESCOM. And I and my final point, I raised this 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 risk because a few years ago, uh, I and some some other people in the Munich or within AMU, we tried we tried using uh, coupons or tokens to raise infrastructure finance to the system. And it was an excellent model, except that uh, the comment we got from Treasury, I tried to recall, was that because it would fall on the balance sheet, I mean, we couldn't prove that it was an off-balance sheet uh, transaction, and, and it fell off then. So, so what I'm saying in summary, if this transaction could be made off-balance sheet, so it doesn't sit on the balance sheet and encumber the utilities, I think it will fly. And, and I say that positively. Thanks, Chris and team. Thank you. Do you want to handle that, Alexandra uh, or, or Vincenzia, um, uh, before we hand over to uh, to Hrubia for his comment? But can we keep it short? <laughs> I'm actually happy for Krabir to take it. I mean, I think that it's a well-made point. Um, how we do it, I haven't wrapped my head around yet. So, Thanks, I agree with that. Love it to Krabir. <laughs> the ball is in your court. <laughs> You've been you know, you haven't, you haven't done enough thinking over the last few months, Krabir. You need to do some more thinking Not for all of more. us. So, so the reason we're here is to ask you to start helping us think about this thing and help solve all of these problems. But, <laughs> but Vali, thank you. Those, those are really uh, interesting uh, 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 questions. Let me just quickly say something about NERSA and regulation. We've had really good uh, inputs from the legal experts here. As a, as a, a regulatory economist, somebody's worked uh, in this space for a long time. Let me just remind people, we live in a constitutional state and with rule of law. NERSA does not make the law. NERSA cannot decide what it regulates. That's determined by the law and by, uh, by the legal framework. And unless there's a very uh, gray area where they have some jurisdiction empowered to have the jurisdiction, they don't, do not decide, right? So this is a legal question. It's not about what NERSA would want to do. It's about getting the right legal answer. And we have the appropriate legal experts in the conversation here. The, the, um, the second point, uh, Vali, and I hope I understand your question correctly, I think the first point I'll make is that uh, uh, at least for the um, for the uh, the actual P the power procurement agreements, of course, the the, the uh, at least in the kind of default model we're talking about here, the local authorities are not the counterparty 
to the to the to the primary transaction, which is the power procurement agreement between the IPP and the buyer, right? But of course, as we heard from, uh, I forget who made a very good point, uh, is, is that the, I mean, the whole idea is to create a diversified offtake base with a liquid secondary market for power. But of course, in the beginning, it's not going to just be there overnight and you probably will have to do, do uh, some due diligence on who the final offtakers are, et cetera. But in principle, what I would say is what's the balance sheet impact for, to, just to get straight to your question, for ESCOM and for municipalities? So, I mean, I think we need to, this is not the final answer on this, but as far as I understand, uh, because the, uh, as we heard earlier on, the term of these tokens will be short. You know, it'll be, we must debate this, but it, it won't be a year or long. It'll be, you know, weeks. It'll be a month, a month and a half, two months, whatever. Maybe we can start a bit longer and shorten it as time goes on. So it's really just a working capital issue in my mind uh, for, for ESCOM. ESCOM is, this, uh, as the tokens are issued, ESCOM builds up a short-term liability. And as it's, as the tokens are redeemed, that liability is worked off. And, and really the same is true for the municipalities. Uh, and it might even be, you know, at the end of the month, the few weeks going into the next month, the municipalities will uh, allow the credits on their customer accounts. And almost at the same time, the credit will be implemented on its account with ESCOM. So it's really just a short-term working capital issue, and it's not cash-related. It's just the short-term debtors and creditors, as far as, as far as I can see. I'll, keep, I'll stop there. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I really, I, need, I see, Clyde, your hand is up, but you've had a crack at this, and I, I, I'm going to call an end because everybody, it's, we're more than half an hour over time. Uh, and and I, I just want to firstly thank Bukelwe. Bukelwe, this has probably been one of the most difficult Q&A sessions that I can imagine. Uh, it's a complex subject uh, uh, that people are still grappling to understand. And I think we're going to need to read Kruvia's uh, uh, document again and again uh, to get to grips with it. Uh, and, and, and I see that the, there have been a lot of questions. Uh, quite a lot of them have been attended to uh, you know, on the Q&A by the, the respondents in text form. Uh, 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 quite a few of them have been dealt with by Yuba Kualwa in the Q&A. And we've allowed, uh, had a, quite a few uh, hands uppers uh, who've asked their question directly and, and got answers. So I, I hope the Q&A and the panel discussion has been meaningful, but it has been a very difficult uh, subject uh, of, of a q and I, 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 And, and Bukawa, uh, I don't know how uh, I could have done it. And so you, you've played an important role there. So thank you uh, to you and to the Power Futures Lab. Uh, I also want to thank uh, most sincerely uh, the sponsors uh, today. That, that, that is Standard Bank, uh, and Africa Green Co., and Alan Overy. You know, without your sponsorship, uh, uh, these things are not sustainable. It's been an important topic. Uh, but I'd also like to, to thank um, the South African IPP Association, the Power Futures Lab, uh, and ESCOM, uh, you know, for their support, for coming to the table, with very valuable insights, uh, At and, and Mandi uh, and, 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 and Bukawa. Uh, really, thank you very much to your respective organizations for your input. This subject is only starting. Uh, we've done this, uh, this poll, and uh, we're going to be analyzing it carefully to understand uh, you know, uh, how to take this forward. Uh, what Javier has indicated to me, I, I, I personally agree with, that the heavy lifting going forward is going to have to come from business and the private sector. Uh, and that's where the drive has got to come. And that's what we're trying to uh, look at uh, is to the appetite, uh, you know, by uh, people who participated today in taking this forward and doing some of the heavy uh, hard work, which will need to be done at various levels up to the, the you know, the NECOM work, work, work stream nigh, uh, and, and higher, even into, in, into the presidency and into the Ministry of Electricity at least. So, it's the beginning, I think, of, of a lot of hard work. I, I want to thank uh, most particularly Javier Stein and Meridian for the very innovative work that they've put in. This is immense work. Probably they don't get any remuneration for this kind of uh, work and, and, and for putting these ideas on the table. Uh, but be that as it may, it, it's uh, highly appreciated. Uh, it's been very stimulating. And uh, it, it, it is trying to address some of the issues that is holding back the country uh, and uh, primarily the, the question of how to unlock new generation capacity, how to, uh, you know, through market mechanisms, 
uh, and 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 uh, electricity uh, uh, credit tokens, uh, and these these ideas are complicated for us mere humans, uh, who I personally find you know the financial part of these things extremely difficult to get my head around because I'm not a financial person. But to have a person like Javier and the others on this uh, on, on this panel who've got both technical and financial and legal and trading expertise. And that's the panel we put together here today. I think it's added a lot of value. So thank you to, to everybody concerned. And then particularly, of course, to those who've participated today for, for, for participating in the poll, for your interest and enthusiasm and questions. Uh, it indicates that there is a significant interest in this. We'll feed you the results shortly uh, in the next day or so. And uh, I'd like to just thank you again and say um, all the best and have a great afternoon going forward. And that's where we bring this uh, webinar to an end. Thank you.